Mike, turn your games down. Hi, we're here a comic episode of Games My Mom Found. I am Mike Elberton, and who's seeking vengeance with me tonight? Former Purple Dragon, Red Fox. <laughs> and welcome, and we are getting to the, the episode we've all been waiting for, or at least I've been waiting for, for fucking, <laughs> what, a couple years now since we first did this? And I was like, I gotta read that one day. That's a long time coming. Oh god, yes. So we're here we we're, we're here to break down TMT Ventions with his issues 45 from 50 of the main series for a change, which is the big climactic like storyline that you've been waiting for 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 a long fucking time they've been building up to this. And it definitely was not what I expected. So <laughs> I will say that. Like I mean cuz you've been talking about this for a long time back when we first did Changes Constant and I wasn't even into, like, I wasn't even sure what the hell. I'm like, okay, Turtles, whatever. Like, I didn't care at the time. And I was like, all right, you know, this sounds interesting, cool, we'll get to it. But it didn't really interest, I wasn't, like, hugely invested. You know, and then as time progressed, and I've been reading more of these, I've gotten really fucking into these. And I could not wait to get here. <laughs> yeah, I, and people that have been listening will uh, attest to that, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, like, I saw the cover of the first issue of this arc, 45, and it didn't really, like, it didn't get me. I'm like, okay, cool, it's Casey on the cover, ready to hit Hun across the face of a baseball bat. And for some reason, it looks like Hun has a top knot on his head in that picture. Nearly. So it's just, this just looks like you could swap Streets of Rage <laughs> for the cover or something, and and that's it. This is just a beat em up cover. It's not that a very like, good cover. It doesn't scream like, hey, this shit's about to get real. No, it doesn't. And the last thing you read, if you were just reading the main stuff, is Donnie pretty much got killed. You think. You don't really know what happened. They don't say he's dead. You just know they broke his shell. I mean, I know more now, but that's all you knew coming into this. Right. You know, and that's a very key point to, to where it's come. But yeah, no, the cover just didn't grab me. Like, I was expecting a cooler cover, not just this, you know, like a beat 'em up cover. <laughs> so, <laughs> cause that's, a fair, that's a fair way to put it. Yeah, this streams like Streets of Rage, or not Streets of Rage. Well, yeah, Streets of Rage and uh, Street Fighter, when they're like in front of that building in the in the first game, where it's like kind of like a, a cutscene in a way. Like, that's all this looks <laughs> like. To me. That's fair. I'll take it. I, I won't argue with that. I don't know, it just didn't work for me. And so I, I was like, all right, you know, we'll, we'll see where this goes. Because I was definitely excited, no matter what, to read this. And like the first couple pages, you have just a random turtle that wakes up. The art's different. You can tell he's supposed to be in heaven or something of that nature, some afterlife, and he's talking to his mother. This is like that astral plane that Leo has been to, Splinter has been to, I, I think even some of the other turtles have ventured here, maybe, or maybe it's just Leo, Leo and Donnie. But yeah, that's that's what they're showing here, and obviously that's when Mom pops up. And I thought that was that was cool to see. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> maybe, you know. I was like, all yeah, right. It's is... like, I know he's, I know he comes back because I know he's in later issues. Like, I've seen him on covers of stuff and people post. Like, I know he ain't dead. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm like, oh, where are we going to go with this? You know, and it, and it surprised me. And I like how it, then it shows Fugitoid getting back and he's like, hey, I, I'm back. I got great news. Like, General Krang is, you know, he's been taken away. And, you know, you just see the turtles, everybody's heartbroken. They're like, they killed him. Donnie's dead. Yeah. And he's like, your plan worked, my friend. What the hell? Like he's he's, he's just so confused. Yeah. It's supposed to be a glorious moment, and and here here they are practically mourning their brother. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's fucked up, and the fact where the future toy is like he's not dead when he touches him. Apparently, he can sense a pulse, even though you know does he really need his fingers because you know he's a robot. Like, but hey, whatever. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's got like those little heart rate monitors, like we got in our watches now, <laughs> his fingertips. My guess is that he must have been so close to death that, like, they couldn't tell, is my guess. I think, I think that's what it is. Like, his, like he says his, in here, he says his pulse is very weak. And like had he getting weaker by the second. Like, had he been, like, a regular person, he was dead type of thing. Quite possibly. You know, I mean, being that he's a mutant, I'm sure that's the only reason. <laughs> I mean, something like, I mean, I'm trying to say more of, like, we would, even if it was an art, you know, the real world, and you had people with technology came, they'd say, okay, he's, he, it's over. Like, there's no... The oh, yeah, toy is so back. advanced. Well, yeah. So if it wasn't for him, he he would be dead. Yes. That's how I took it. So I don't it's, think it's a good moment. Another way to bring him back at this moment, considering no, the circumstances. Probably not. It was it's a, it was a good moment. I, I like it. I like that they save. You know, they're able to save him, and just how 
you know, our future story is like, you know, we need to get him somewhere cold immediately and then runs off back to Bernal Island. You know, it's just very cool. And I also can't believe how much Harold plays an important part in stuff going on in this. Yeah, you he's know, a very vital sub character or supporting character. I did not expect that. And that's not over yet for him, so we'll see him some more. Oh no, I, I assume that there's a lot more of him coming on, but it's just that was never what I expected in this. I would have never expected Harold to become like this big character that he becomes throughout this. It's just kind of, but again, it's not surprising everything with this damn, you know, book always throws me for a loop. So mm-hmm. I've come to accept that. <laughs> it's just a thing. You should. Point. But the fact that like when they tell Splinter that he's not dead and Splinter realizes like what to do and you see him meditate and then all of a sudden he goes into the afterlife also. I wasn't expecting that. I thought that was a really cool moment to be like he's like he because he understands where his son is like all right i'm gonna go find him mm-hmm. you know and like when you see that little like you see him walking in a hedge maze like i guess the whole idea is that donatello was going to go to the afterlife but he stops him i'm guessing that's kind of where they were going with oh, this yeah, he was yeah he was well on the way and splinter this is the only way he can talk to him and communicate obviously and i don't think he maybe he didn't know that donnie was on his way to the afterlife but he sure as hell wanted to find out anything he could i think he must have knew enough well, because I think in these cases, like Leo has been here and whatnot and whoever else, Leo wasn't really close to death, so to say. So it's I think this is like representing the subconscious, something different to where it could lead you to the afterlife. Yeah, and I like that. I, I really do. And then like when it cuts back to, you know, sh- the, ho- the foot and you see that Hun's missing, you know, they don't know what they're like, waiting on Shredder to come back and Karai is kind of taken over for the moment. And, like, when Alopex, not Alopex, what the fuck is her Why do I have such a hard time with a bird? I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember her name. <laughs> That's Koya. Koya. I, Koya and Bludgeon show up, and, like, I like how there's a panel of her of Karai holding a bow and arrow with, with two arrows just ready to kill him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, about the master, who they were instructed to be with, but yeah, she's wondering what the hell's going on. Well, I mean, they left it like uh, where you were expect. You know, you you came back, but Shredder didn't. Like you ain't you ain't surviving. Even though an arrow would not kill Bludgeon at all, I'm pretty sure. Um, so. Yeah, I, it might debilitate them. She gets him in the eye. But that's not how that's going. I mean, he's we see he, he took like a gun to the mouth and he was okay. Like no yeah, arrow. I mean, Koya maybe sure. could die from an arrow if you hit her in the neck. I don't think yeah, she. Sure. But I mean, she's got a knife to her neck in this scene here. But it's that like, would kill her. They, they are still afraid of cry. And actually she could probably whoop their ass. I mean, something, as long as they can't grab her, she can <laughs> sure do. She could do some damage. I think she could kill Koya, but I don't think she could kill bludgeon. Maybe not with her conventional weapons, but she could figure something out if she's smart enough. Yeah. And she's pretty damn smart. I've seen so far in this book. So, you know, there's a reason she's the granddaughter of shredder and, <laughs> and all that. So you're, you'll see Karai a lot throughout this. I uh, trust me after the end of this when we talk, get to the end of this I was like what the fuck so mm-hmm. we'll get there <laughs> but I just love how she's like you know I'm taking control of the foot and you know and until we find out what goes on with Shredder like I'm in charge period like I love that yeah it you know? makes sense she's she's ruthless and, and calculating and she's damn near another Shredder but better I think I, I don't think she would be as crazy as Shredder or as evil as Shredder? Maybe I, I'm yeah, wrong. I think she's even more calculated than Shredder is. It was, Shredder's absolutely ruthless, and she shares some of that, but it's it's more calculated, I think, he, than he is. He's too hung up on revenge, too. Yeah, in most cases, you can connect that back to emotion, whereas Karai doesn't really show that anymore, especially now that Leo's out of the picture. No, and she's very happy about that. <laughs> And also, this book really shows, like, one of the key things of this arc, which we see next panel or next page, is that because Shredder is gone, it gives more hope or, you know, the right word to put here, for the Purple Dragons. Like, they think, okay, we got this. Like, we're in charge now, you know, we're going to do our thing. Like, it shows them breaking into a liquor store. And you see people that really look like the Purple Dragons that are right out of 2003 cartoon. I know they're not, but that's what it kept reminding me of. Right. <laughs> that damn cartoon, which I'm not the biggest fan of, but, you know, it has its moments. <laughs> I mean, I, I do like it, but it, it's hard to go back to. But, it, it, that, I mean, it's just cool to see. And I like how this comes, this plays in. You have a older couple, which were, were buying groceries, but they just have to leave their groceries and run because the Purple Dragons are causing trouble. Which right. I, I, it's kind of questionable, like, 
Hun's decision to take off like that because just because Shredder's not around, you know, always he always gave credit to the foot for giving him purpose again, giving him, a, in his words, a job. Um, <laughs> and, and to just, like, turn his life around again, in his words. And yet, they're not around for a little while, and he goes and, and does this. And just, well, I guess he goes back to drinking, which kind of domino effect to what you see now. Oh, I, I, we're going to talk about that real quick when we get there. I have I have comments about that drinking scene, but I have a few comments. But like, and this is when you first get introduced to Casey in this, and you haven't seen Casey in a while, and just the panel of Casey in the shadows, like that looks like something right out of like a horror comic, in my assumption. I don't read horror comics. Oh, uh, yeah. He's, he looks like he's ready to really whip some ass in this case. And yeah. uh, you got to think if you're those guys seeing that kind of silhouetted figure, it kind of would suck, I feel. And is this the first time he uses a cricket bat in in this series? It might be. I honestly don't remember because I don't remember a cricket bat before. I mean, again, it's this is a there's a reason why I'm asking this question, but it made me laugh when I saw the cricket bat. I think you know why. So, well, yeah, throw back to the movie, ninety movie, yeah. Cricket, what's cricket? Only forget. I got. I can't even remember the quote now, but I like. I know. I can picture the scene in my head. He's like, yeah, I think he uh, rap says something about you need to eat crumpets. To, to use the cricket, like the yes. cricket. <laughs> and again that did i mean that blew over my head as a kid but now i completely understand i mean because cricket is a is a huge ass fucking sport but not here yeah. not in yeah, america so, and that's raf wasn't wrong like i i don't think i think that was my first introduction to what a cricket was at that time in my life when i was such a young kid and then i didn't see it too much more after that <laughs> I just love how he's like, you need crumpets on a shag cricket. And that's some yeah, of the, the coolest things about like this comic uh, in particular and like the Power Rangers comic, as we were talking about off the air. <laughs> they actually throw things in from other media that just kind of spices it up for the true fans out there. Yeah, for sure. And like the thing with, with, with this too, like he beat the shit out of him with a cricket bat and... Yeah, that that bad. I mean, I didn't understand cricket, but I know enough now because of stuff that had to do with cricket that involved people and in being real, doing really shady shit. Because I watched a lot of those documentaries like that. And like, no, that bat will fucking hurt. That's a solid ass bat. Yeah. He beat the shit out of a couple people with a cricket bat. And I like how one guy's name is Link, the guy that has like a freaking chain that he uses as a weapon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I noticed that. I was, why did they do that? Because he Maybe has because a, he's got a chain what? link. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that that's 100% what the joke was. You, oh, I guess, but you think of Link, you ain't thinking about a chain. That's a <laughs> grappling hook or hook shot. Or... It, it's still funny. I and mean, then he just hits the guy behind the knees with the cricket bat. Like, that guy is fucking out. Well, he fucks that guy up. And again, this all just reminds me of a beat em up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Every even scene. though the guy gets up and walks away, even though, in my opinion, he should not be getting up and walking away. But, you know, I see the here nor there. But... Yeah, well, when he caught him in the legs, it. it didn't show that he broke anything, so he kind of just knocked him off balance. Then what really hurt wasn't a leg issue; it was that knee to the goddamn chin that's going to do the damage. <laughs> oh yeah, that would fucking hurt. Too. Yeah, the guy's not okay. He should not be getting up next scene walking away. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I guess he's a big dude, but that's still that's going to hurt anybody. I don't give a shit. I think you're. That. I mean, wouldn't that? Wouldn't both of those pretty much kill you? Like the knee to the face, and I mean, no, and his knee kneecap to the nose if he goes somewhere it shouldn't. I guess, but. Uh, it doesn't mean instant death, you know. Like guys, but you wouldn't be walking away. I feel. Yeah, you can walk away from that. It, you're not gonna. It's not gonna feel great, and <laughs> you could be losing teeth, like Joan <laughs> says in in one of the panels. You know? <laughs> but yeah, it's gonna severely hurt and won't necessarily debilitate you. And I didn't catch this my first reading because I think I was in a hurry. Then he gives the cricket bat to the store owner of the liquor store that he helps. Yeah, I did not catch that my first reading of this, but I caught it when I read it the second time for this episode. Because I read this twice, of course. Of course. Now you're technically reading myself. it again, damn near. Oh, it depends how long it takes, but yes. <laughs> if there's a good chance, I'll read this a third I'll read this a third time, depending on how long it takes us. So um, enjoy it for the third time. <laughs> when I'm it. trying not to. I don't want to do it that much times. But no, it, it's it's good. And then you see Han, and I didn't catch it either the first time that Han is going into the antique store that April's parents own. Or yeah, Casey's so going to look for Casey, yeah. And I don't know why, but for some reason, that com- I completely missed that last time. I don't know. didn't click. busting into some random place? or Yeah, I think so. Even though, like, you know, later on in this book, you see, I think you see him again. Yeah, you see him again, but I don't know. It didn't click for some reason. You I do, got... and you see, don't you see the parents, too? Like, yeah, parents it, it didn't click. I, I think I was tired, and I was just reading this when I was tired, so. 
that was the effect. But I still really like where that goes and what comes out of it. Like, and then it, then it it kicks back to Donatello talking to his mother, and this is when or no, Splinter doesn't. Yeah, and she's she's kind of cagey about you know what's going on. He's like, where am I? But you had brought up something way earlier many times throughout our, our, our quest of reading turtles, like where you had said Donatello is the one that, you know, ha- had a lot of questions about the afterlife and them being reincarnated and where this is going. And I think it's interesting that he's the one that, you know, is the one that's pretty much being faced even more with more questions about that, about spirit, ash, spirit, ash, yeah, whatever that word is, you know? So I thought that was interesting that he's the one that's mm-hmm. going through this, the non-believer. Right. I think it's very fitting. They did that. And, and it's very possible that they had that planned all along. Like, hey, we're going to kill Donnie. Let's build him up to be a, a non-believer and an atheist and just question everything. This guy is forced to face everything that he that is illogical. Yeah, and I like that. Again, just paying off things that, you know, and again, if you were, if you were some guy just reading this as it comes out, you might not, like, it wouldn't have the same effect like us where we read everything of this in, like, a, you know, six months or so. Like, uh, and even different. here, like, Donnie's an astral plane right now, ready to go to the great beyond and he says i've never seen anything like this i should be freaking out right now i mean this just doesn't seem logical at all there he goes still trying to think as logical as possible but he's experiencing it firsthand i wonder if we you know if you're when you have you know near-death experiences that you just you are kind of calm just because well you're not you know <laughs> the theory is that you know you're not in your body so well i mean there's that and well he's, he's not feeling any pain he's not no anxiety it's just and he's in a, in a place that resembles peace and yeah. he's seeing somebody that can also add to that peace being his mom yeah someone that's been dead for in this case hundreds of years <laughs> yeah, right yes I, I do like how they line up they line up dialogue like where the last the last thing she says to him perhaps the more appropriate question would be where are you going and then it cuts to it's fugitory really weird like this this whole dynamic with the mom like kind of leading him through to the to the afterlife. I get it, but it almost seems wrong. Like it's bad. You know, like it's not her. It, it, I'm sure it is. They, they I think it's more of he that. was fucking dead. Like there was no coming back because you don't. We won't. Talk, we'll get to it in the second part of this conversation. But like, yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't going to come out of any any normal way. He was surviving that. Right, and and I guess she was just doing her job, her role as yeah. to helping him kind of with that transition kind of like death and sand if you have you ever read sandman or watched the show i have not no okay you should do both of those but <laughs> not anytime soon because that will take away from us recording this so don't do that anytime soon but <laughs> sandman they have a character named death i'll go on very quick and like she has things where there's like one part very early on when you first get introduced her, so she's a guy and she's and he's hitting on her she's like well i'll see you soon you know timothy and he's like what how'd you know my name i didn't even tell you and then he shortly after he hit by a car and she comes oh. and and like, that's her whole point. I mean, that's what she does. She's death. She comes. She takes people away. And and she'll come and and the guy's like, you know, what's going on? Like, what's happening? And she's like, it, it's okay. Like, it's so everything's gonna be all right. Just just come with. Me. And it's a very interesting take on that. And it it really reminds me a lot of this. Like, that's kind of what she is. Is she's death in in this sense. Hmm. I guess in a way. I, I mean, I doubt she plays this role for anybody else. Uh, no, I, I mean, I just yeah. her family, different universe. But yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but I, I get. Kind of, this is her role in this instance, yes. You know, be in that midway point to take you to the other side. So you're not just a lost yeah. spirit running around. For somebody that her son will trust and yeah. that she can actually help out with. Yeah, it makes sense. Because I'm sure if you saw, like, the Grim Reaper standing there with a sickle, you'd be like, come with me! You'd be like, oh, fuck you. Mm, nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, like, this is where you see Fugitoid then putting on this helmet. And I did not expect this to go where it goes. And he's like, all right, we're going to. You know, like we're attaching his, you know, we're putting it in his brain and, you know, we're going to, I don't think he really says what well, he's up to. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody will. I mean, they they understand what Fugitoid is, I'm pretty sure. But for him to recreate that, I don't think that they're ready for that or can fully comprehend maybe other than Harold. Yeah, maybe Harold. But it's it's cool. And then, you know, you see the, the rest of the group and Angel and the other turtles and Alopex. You know, like, you know, wondering what the hell's going on, and Ralph just gets pissed. <laughs> Ralph again? <laughs> yep. <laughs> that wasn't my purpose either this time. <laughs> no, it was the first time. Raphael just gets pissed, and I love how he walks away, and I think it's Alopex that goes after him, or? She does, yeah. Okay, that's not but Ralph here, is, but... is throwing a fit. I mean, in this case, I get it. It's it's really touchy subject. It's, it's, there's 
almost like no hope in his case, like a less than 10% chance that they're going to yeah. ever see their brother breathing again. So the rap being the most emotional one is just losing it. And, you know, I, when I was reading this again, you know, kind of I always saw myself as a Raphael character. Like I always saw myself in him. The only thing that I dislike about the character, even though it, it makes him who he is, is some of that emotion because he's just such a loose cannon with it that it sucks to not see a well put together emotional person. I think Leo shows that very well. He's a very well put together, emotionally mature person. Yeah. I mean, uh, they each bring a I, different part to it, but yeah. Yeah. I, I think in this case, like I, I tried to remind myself that Raphael's also still technically supposed to be a teenager. So he only fought it so much. Yeah. No, that's very fair. It's a, you know, and again, they also blame themselves too, because they weren't there when Donnie got <clears throat> killed because they were fighting Krang. Mm. I mean, I like to quote the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the needs of the one. Thank you, Spock. But it's very, I mean, this is a case where if they wouldn't have stopped Krang, guess what? It wouldn't have mattered. You're all fucking dead anyway. So, yay, our brother survived. Right. He was killed by Bebop. Oh, wait, nope. He was killed instead by the big ray and death, and we're all dead. All right. Like, it doesn't matter. Right. So, just, all turtles die or one dies. So, cool. It's not even all there. turtles. Every fucking person on the planet. Well, yeah. But I meant, like, all brothers are dead or just one. Like, I mean, I mean, Donatello made the right sacrifice, and I think had, I think he even says, like, later on, like, this, that was the right decision. I mean, it is. It was. It was the right decision. I just think, well, you got to think Donnie didn't intend to sacrifice himself. No, no, it wasn't like he happened. closed the nuclear thing and stayed in the room while the radiation killed him. No, like, <clears throat> it wasn't like that. Which which I like more, because I, I feel like that's, that's so cliche. In this case, it's just circumstances happened. He got himself in too deep. And things went bad, yeah. and that's how life is. You know, you ex- you know, you can't plan for everything. You can't plan. Well, I mean, at least in real life, we don't have to worry about a giant rhinoceros taking a sledgehammer to our back. But you know, you never know what's going to happen. Fucking hope not. <laughs> <laughs> We're not there yet. Uh, I would not be surprised if there are people out there trying to make mutant animals. But hey, I would not be surprised. Mm-hmm. And, and then it and then it cuts to Shredder, which is the first time you've seen Shredder since Attack on the Technodrome, where he was taken with Stockman, and I. And again, we get we get Stockman again, but we get evil Stockman again. We don't get Crane's puppet Stockman like we had for the well, last I, few I'm issues. I'm glad that's that's character development. Same. That I actually like this this version of Stockman. I mean, you could kind of see it; it was always there, but now it's just full force. Like Stockman does not give a fuck, and he's he's almost manipulating Shredder. Not even almost. I, I guess he technically is, and, and him being the intellectual and as devious as he is, and you got to think. He always goes, even himself, goes back to that chess game with his father. He's playing chess right now with Shredder as his, his knight or his bishop, if you will. Yeah, that's a fair way to put it. And I think that's cool to have him again because, I mean, ever since Tro- the Kang War arc, he's kind of been, he's been with Kang the whole time. So that was like issue 20 something. You know, you haven't really had him being himself in a very long time and this is also the first time you start seeing him become the vil- one of the villains that I'm assuming is going to be part of the big bads that are going on for the current stuff. That's how so I think. Baxter, he's you'd probably be surprised where things go, but he's going to be around for a while doing some shit you probably wouldn't have guessed. Okay. I'm just kind of wondering what kind of whiskey he's got in that cup. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you like whiskey. <laughs> but like, you know, he, he he has Shredder laying on his bed and Shredder attacked him because, you know, it's Shredder. Oh, no context sentence. <laughs> Shredder laying in his bed. Because <laughs> <laughs> he rescued him and he put him in his bed, but he has his clothes on. So, you know, <laughs> but no weapons. Weapons are off the side. <laughs> so maybe you should got rid of the weapons completely, you know, like, you know, not have right. them around. Yeah, because like, he uh, sure found those claws really fast. Oh, they're, they're right next to him. Yeah. Yeah. But he put them on real fast and you see the issue. You see the panel where he's got Stockman just trying to enjoy his whiskey. And he puts the claws ne- against his neck. And Baxter isn't missing a, a step. Like he's still being this smug ass way because he's got such a, a plan ahead of him. And even, you know, his whole thing was, we're going to have a partnership. And, he, and I love how he, he says a little about the partnership. And he says, if however you change your mind about our partnership, then I'm sure my friends here will have no problem seeing you out. I must warn you, though, this penthouse suite and you won't be leaving by the elevator or stairs. And two flyborgs come down to, to grab them if they need to. <laughs> mm-hmm. I fucking love that. Because, again, I mean, they, you know, they, because he wants Shredder's money and power and resources. Well, you, know, re, you know, he wants what Shredder has to help him advance his means. Right. Which, again, makes sense. And then the last couple panels, <laughs> or the last, like, two-part spread page is Splinter finding Donatello, 
before Donatello can go into the light and then bringing him back with him into the darkness, which essentially his mind wakes up, which again, I didn't see this coming inside Shellhead. Is that what it's called, right? Metalhead. Metalhead. No, I was close. <laughs> but yeah, now they, that last panel, man, him being in that robot is one of the biggest things I wanted you to see because I thought it was such a cool damn art. It is. I mean, and the first thing he says, what have you done to me? And can you just imagine in that robotic kind of distorted voice? And I, it really made me think a lot. And I want to have I have questions now. So if you were given the option to be put into a robotic body, would you take it? Me personally? Uh, yes. On the surface, I'd say yes. But I, I, I feel anybody that's going to take that should really consider what that means. And, and that means no sleep. It means the norm of eating food is gone. That means, Sign me up. You know what I mean? It's 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 for some people great, some people no. I mean, because it's almost it's eternity. You it probably see a lot of suicide, like robotic suicide. Oh, I mean that that's, that's that just point. that's. I mean that would make sense because you're in a in a way that you won't ever die. So eventually you're going to want to be done. I already have a pretty big interest in bionics as it is, like as far as machinery and same mechanics. I, like, I, I tell my wife kind of, all the time I would have my eyes changed out if I could to have a camera in my face. I could download the images I want. For sure. I mean, yeah, I, thought I, mean, a lot, just, but... I, I thought of more of like medical purposes. Like you lose a leg, you get a new fucking limb that's better than what you had. I mean, stuff like that. But, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, not me. Like I was thinking about this today when I was, and I wanted to bring it up to you. Like I would, I would a hundred percent, if I was given the option, especially like if you had a terminal illness or something, then I was still young. I'd be like, fuck it. Put me in the robot. I don't have to eat. I don't have to sleep. The only thing I'd miss is I wouldn't, you can't have sex because you're a robot. You can, but it won't. Well, probably, probably, sure, there's no feeling there because <laughs> you're a robot. Sure. Right. No, that's I the think, only thing. Um, personally, yeah, I, I would probably be vastly interested in it because I I love the idea of consuming knowledge, and that's all I can think of. Like you consume all the knowledge you want. I mean, one, you're a robot, so your brain is gonna, you know, you already can get information so fast. You could read every. You could just, I would, yeah, hundred percent go for it. I thought about this a little too much, but yes, sign me. Seemingly so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, then that brings us to issue two of this arc. This covers a this covers a better. This started getting me more interested in what we we're reading because the top part of the cover is Stockman looking like an, a god or something for red eyes and flyborgs and mousers, and then the bottom of the mm-hmm. cover is Karai with the foot in the background. Looks like some uh, Ghostbusters crossover. That's fair. That's very fair. But I liked it. And then it, this issue opens up with Donatello teaching them how to take care of his body. How to, you know, get the air bubbles out of the bag. And I, I like all that. And he talks about a catheter, which, again, makes sense because that's what would happen. So I thought, I thought well, again, as a guy who kind of works in the medical field to a degree, I found this very interesting. I mean, I work in a very different part of the medical field. I work in the sales part of it, but it made me think of it. So there's my part. <laughs> I don't know, it's just really cool. And like, the, you know, and the thing, him making comments, he's like how weird it is he's taking care of his body when he's inside a robotic shell. I don't know. I like it. I like how they ask him. If he's OK. And he's like, no, I'm not OK. Like. <laughs> I'm in a fucking I robot mean, body, guys. <laughs> he shouldn't be. And you'd think if anybody's going to be excited to be in it, in a robot body, it'd be him. But when it's not his choice and it's so sudden and he don't, he doesn't even know at first technically what was going on with him. You know, this is this is a, a shock in every which way possible, yeah. spiritually, emotionally, physically, just shock. And I'm surprised he's just not numb and he's talking at all. That's fair. Because it's got to be a hell. I mean, all of a sudden to wake up inside a robot. Like, I'm sure a lot of people, if it was re- if it was something you could do in real life, would not be OK with it. They would freak out. And I'm just 100 percent sure. Eh? You, you got to think like they I'm surprised he's just going to need more time to himself immediately. It's got to it's got to be cool though, at the same time. Like, imagine like you break your arm, comes off, just get a new arm. Like, you know what? I want to fly now. All right. We'll, we'll put a wing attachment to your back. The jet pack, so. yeah, maybe you should watch some more um, ghosts in the show. <laughs> I've never seen it, but I should watch it someday. You know, did the movie? I've only seen the Scarlett Johansson movie because Scarlett Johansson. Oh no, 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 I meant the original anime movie. Yeah, no, I need to watch it. It's been on my list oh, a few times okay. to get around to. Well, if you need somebody for that, I might watch it with you. That's a that's a good one. Okay, we'll see. I, I, I it's been on a poll before for the Patreon, but then it didn't win. Mm. But I've, it's something that I think about every so often. Like I, I should really cover that. Yeah, you should. I'm trying to watch more movies I've never seen before in general, just to be more educated person, I guess, in, in that sense. Uh, that one, a little more a little ahead of its time. Uh, they, they did something special with that one. Okay, you're selling it more, so I'll, I might make it happen at some point. We'll see. Well, but you, as you can tell so far, <laughs> as we're currently reading Vengeance, 
<laughs> we, um, I don't really bullshit you when I think something's good. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree. <laughs> you were not wrong with this. And this is where you see Raphael then sitting with Alapex. And I like it that she's the one that comes to comfort him because they have, you kind of, you know, you see in, in Mutanimal, or no, not, you know, a couple arcs ago, like they start to, when they get caught in the cage with, hi, it's Pete, that idiot. Like you have, oh <laughs> I had to make that reference. <laughs> <laughs> but you know and like you see it they're getting closer and i like how you know she says what are friends for right and i like how angel's like friends huh <laughs> mm-hmm. i love that because <laughs> again she knows you know there's more there like i just love it like that it's oh, so no. cool how <laughs> they become a team like you know angel and alapex just traveling around together and beating the shit out of people that deserve it right yeah it's a team i don't mind at all i think it feels uh maybe not extremely natural but it works yeah it definitely does and then this is where you see then the continuation of what happened last issue where Casey then come when he came into the antique store with in, with April's parents. Hun is in there drinking a bottle of whiskey, which uh, did you look at the bottle to see what it says for the name of it? Yeah, it was Zach Daniels. Yeah, <laughs> I <It> looks just <laughs> like it too, man. It, like it says Tennessee whiskey in the same font. Same, same font, color, everything. Everything. It just says Zach Daniels. Because <laughs> they couldn't name it without getting yeah, and having course. to pay. I think that's hilarious. Uh, is that is he, is Jack Daniels good whiskey? I don't drink whiskey. It's definitely not my go-to. I like it. I think like when I I happen to take my like a big period of time where I don't drink it and I have it like at a bar because it's the only decent thing I got. I don't mind it. It's actually decent enough. It's also one of the more common whiskeys, isn't it? Around here, it's, in it's general? extremely extremely okay. common. I mean, you ask for a Jack and Coke, that's what you're getting. You're getting Jack Daniels whiskey. Oh, good point. That's one of the most common drinks ever so yeah okay i just that's just so fucking funny that they that they named it differently <laughs> i mean they had to but it's just the fact that they took the exact bottle like when you look at this you know what they're referencing the exact bottle on uh, everything i mean the font the you know everything about that bottle is looks like a 100 percent jack Daniel bottle you would see in a liquor store it just made me laugh a lot and, and you see hun drinking again which is again a big point because since he became Hun, he wasn't drinking, but because Shredder is dead, he thinks, he decided to start drinking again. So and that, that shows you that unless somebody's leading or telling Hun what to do, like like his wife was before, because he wasn't drinking when she was alive. Now she's gone, he had to drink, and then now that Shredder's gone, he has to drink again, because he doesn't know how to handle life on his own. He's completely codependent. Yeah, but like it's cool how you you have him going from the the drunken buffoon type guy like all smile like oh hey and then when Angel shows up and they threaten him you just see him crush that bottle in his bare hand and I thought that was cool like to see the sudden change in his eyes the way they drew it oh yeah yeah no that was good I like uh, also again how they make uh, Alopex's face too I like, think mm-hmm. they did a good job on that that's some fierce shit there. That looks like an angry dog. dog. Yeah. And not an angry chihuahua. Because I know you've seen many times. Yeah. Wild goddamn dog. (laughs) And this is not the only bottle that's broke in this arc. (laughs) No. (laughs) There's another one pretty I think it might even be in this book, but I know it's coming up, so (laughs) he breaks a few bottles. They they break a lot of bottles and I like how April's parents then meet Alapec and she's like, Oh, I wasn't expecting to meet you know a talking wolf. Like, all right, cool. Or talking fox. She's a fox. Mm -hmm. fox. Yeah. And just the way they do some of the stuff again, where they use text boxes to com- to convey multiple things, where Angel, you know, says, you know, telling Casey what happened with Donatello, and she's like, we have been battered, we have been bloody, and at the same time it shows Hun looking at his bloody hand, because, you know, he broke a fucking bottle of his hands, fucking idiot. <laughs> I don't get that. Why would you break a bottle of your hands? Like, it must be terrible. Oh, well, when you're a drunk asshole that doesn't really logically think anything through, not a big surprise. I really have, like, an issue with my hands being cut in any shape or form. I noticed, like, a yeah. personal thing. Like, the idea of having my hands cut up just bothers me. Oh, you'd hate my job. <laughs> I'm very careful with my hands not getting hurt. I've noticed, too. So That's weird. I mean, I, I never knew that about you, but... That it guy? came after I went flying off a bike because I was a fucking idiot. Yeah, this is fair. Mm-hmm. Right, story time. I went down a real big hill for people that know this is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Wilson Park. There was a big sk- hill next to a golf course and a lake at the bottom end, and I decided to take my bike, go down this hill, and lo and behold, I couldn't stop. And it was either go into the lake or go left down the path, which was gravel. I went down the path and found out that when your bike hits gravel you go, and you're going to that speed, you go flying off said bike into the gravel. And I got rocks in my hands. I remember that. Like, I cut up my hands, and after that, I was like, no, fuck that shit. We ain't cutting up the hands no more. So There's a science class for you there. 
<laughs> I mean, I, I was just I was a dumb kid. I mean, I was I was well, 16, 17, so I had a job. I remember you know, I worked. You know, at, what's worse about this? this you, how old were you? Sixteen. I was I was working at Clapper, which doesn't exist anymore, by the way. You did that. At, I thought you were going to tell me you were like ten. No, I was a junior in high school. I was a junior in high school. Were you still a ten year old brain? I that was a stupid brain. Whatever the hell it was, and I wasn't even I wasn't <laughs> drinking. I can tell you that I didn't do any drugs or anything. It was just this seemed like a good idea. Nope. Hear your mom's whining at this point. <laughs> I'm sure there was some of that when I got home. Uh-huh. I remember I had to buy biker gloves that had like the fingers in the hole so I could wear gloves over my hands and my hands were all cut up so I could still work oh, and do wow. stuff. Right. So yeah, that's why I, I, that yeah, stuff okay. like that bothers me. Okay, I guess. Makes sense. <laughs> but yeah, no, I was not 10, unfortunately. I was smarter well, I than I guess that's why the, the whole hunt thing triggered me then. Like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, so ever since then, I've always been careful with my hands about cutting them with anything or yeah, just just hate the idea of damaging my hands. I've done well, it. I mean, different times. so my vital, hands. man. You can't use sanitizer. Or... <laughs> <laughs> no. You should see me at work because I deal with a lot of sanitizer at work. So, and I got cut sometimes. I might forget or uh, just, mm-hmm. I don't you remember real fast. Huh? Oh, you feel like you're fucking dead. Especially if I'm trying something out and I got to do it with sanitizer. That's like, oh no, I got to use like the back of my hand or I, saw, I tell somebody else to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to feel this. <laughs> I don't want. To. Yeah, so that's why I I prefer I wear gloves whenever I gotta fuck around with stuff. So yeah, there okay, there we go. <laughs> but All right. This is when you then see Karai telling the Foot Clan like we're gonna get revenge on what happened because they believe that the tur. I think they I think they're after the tur. No, they're after the turtles or does she say <coughs> exactly? Splinter. Oh yeah, they want to kill Splinter because Splinter led them. Well, to, at this you know, point, I don't even think she's talking about it. I think she's just trying to let everybody know that they're unified under her now. I don't think she really. Okay, yeah, you're right. Into, yeah. She just talked about outside. I think they're after Hun, actually. Because yeah, I feel like Hun betr- I mean, just vanished. But I, I don't think... Well, I guess they're talking about outsiders. And I think outsiders refers to somebody like such as Hun and his entire gang. Because technically, they don't need him. No. And then after you see that, you have a brief scene that where Fugitoid telling Donatello in, when he's inside the robot, like, how everything's so different about how, like, the knowledge works. And this idea also excited me, like, you know, having your, you know, you know just be able to pull everything right out of your mind because you're a computer. I like how they, they have this conversation. I think it's a very creative uh, conversation to have between two now seem like very similar characters. Yeah. And he, you know, I like how they bring up the thing about Phantom Pain, too, where he talks about he's like, I'm hungry, but I don't need to eat. I'm tired, but I'm wide awake. And then there's a pain in my back, but there shouldn't be no pain. And I like how mm-hmm. Harold comes up and, you know, tells him Phantom Pain, like. You know, and circuit circuit and rhythm, you know, because your brain is programmed to, you know, tell you these are things you need to do to survive. Yeah. But I thought that was really cool. Just a little stuff, but it made me happy to see. I thought I, I thought it was a great little uh, event there for them to go through. I think it's actually, other than the Hun stuff, probably the most interesting part of this book, them kind of going over that. It's up there. I, there's something else that this book that really got me that we'll be talking about soon. But yeah, no, it's one. It's a really cool moment. And then you have a small scene with Michelangelo and his buddy Woody, who really reminds me of Woody Harrelson from Cheers, that version of Woody Harrelson. But yeah, uh, either here nor I suppose. <laughs> it's a dust. But I like that you have the, you know, you you keep having him as a recurring character, and and he has a purpose. So I like that. And then we get introduced to a character we haven't seen. I can't remember. I think the last time we saw him was Secret History of the Foot, or was mm-hmm. he in one other panel or page somewhere they else? They had him before Pre Vengeance in one of the arts. Where? But it was it was fairly recent. They probably Attack on Technodrome. I think so. Okay, That's I can't, or the April's one out popping up. April's popping up again because she popped up before on him in regards to the split stuff. I like that. This is when you get the scroll, which doesn't really doesn't. Well, I shouldn't say doesn't really doesn't play a part in this arc, but is leaned into more things. Which is again, if you hadn't read the TMT Ghostbusters, none of this won't. Which irritates me how like. One of like because you see the images of the three of the three you know the the three demons, the fox, the the rat king, and the bull. Which the bull you have not been introduced if you have not read that one crossover. Which is nuts. It is. It's not like. Uh. But then she takes the scroll from the professor. Which again, <laughs> good thing she did. But my guess is that they that the foot either knew he was working with her or just was trying to clean up loose ends. Oh, I'm probably clean up loose ends because they said get rid of all the outsiders and. He was technically working for them. Right. Well, I mean, he, he's got knowledge of the clan that even some of the insiders in the clan don't know. So, yeah, let's, let's get rid of this guy. I mean, even then, if, if, he, if they would have took the scroll, I don't think they would have done anything with it because 
pantheon is not their concern or what they're striving for i don't i don't think it bothers them yeah but all it would have done is hinder april and the turtles from making progress in everything you're gonna end up seeing otherwise yep. okay that's fair but I, I was surprised when you see him sit in the car and then all of a sudden you have one of the foot assassins in the car behind with him that just 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 punctures him through the through the stomach and chest with one of his claws yeah, you got some interesting shit coming up with uh, foot assassins, by the way. Um, I'm okay, I'm in. <laughs> it was attention to that. <clears throat> okay, they are fucking badass, by the way. They're fucking crazy looking. Yeah, they remind me of uh, that guy from Soul Calibur. I forget his name. Voldo. Yeah, there you go. Are they like? Are those claws, or are those just a like, weapon that they have on, or those are hands? Uh, they're like big ass claw weapons. They're not the regular okay. hands. These are all humans. Okay, so they're not like mutated humans or something. Yeah, they're not mutated. Okay, okay. And then you, after you see him get murdered, it cuts to Stockman and Shredder, and you see Shredder in a suit, which I thought was cool. <laughs> yeah, that was interesting to see. I, I did like that. He made him dressed up in a suit. <laughs> and you see the TCRI building. Yep. A callback, and I, I, you know, I was like, okay, there's no, there's no random Utrams, you know, in, in control of this building, but it's just. Stockman own, own another building that he was doing his own thing. He was siphoning money away from Krang to <laughs> fund a whole other building. <sighs> cool, though. Yep, shows you that guy's always in motion, man. Always I, got something going on. And he makes the reference to the chess table about his father, which you, if you did not read that one issue of the miniseries thing with his issue, you, that would make no sense to you. Nope. I mean, it would make enough sense to read it, but it's like you would get, you would miss, you're missing as a reference to something or, you know, how it involves more of his dad. But, and you see that he's making more flyborgs and mousers. Just very cool. And then the last part of this book goes back to the to the to the store where April's parents are and Casey, Angel, and Alapex are there. And all of a sudden drunk Hun shows up shaking his bottle. Tell him that, you know, and the purple dragons are all there, and that guy who should not be walking Link is there too with his with a chain, now with a kunai attached to it, ready to ready to beat the shit out of everybody. <laughs> It was yeah, like, oh, it's not a, it's a, it's a scary scene. If, if you're just a normal average person, you see that outside the front door, not a good sight. And then this is where it kind of cuts to, to two different things where this at the same time, we have the free comic book day issue that came out around this time that technically takes place right here for vengeance. And I got to say, this issue was better than that annual we read and the one we didn't read. So, Hey, there's that. <laughs> This is a cool cover, like to get you excited to read, because I mean, again, the whole point of those are get you excited to buy the books. Like this is a cool cover with a cityscape, the you know, the four turtles and then Shredder in the center with demon eyes. Very cool cover. Is a picture you just sent in chat Shredder is supposed to be in a suit? Yes. What is that from? That is actually the main antagonist from a movie from the 90s called Only the Strong. Oh, OK. That does look like that Shredder is, in this. It looks a lot like that scene with him in the suit. That's all I can think of. Okay, I never heard of this movie before. Watch it. <laughs> it's like the best, like, I'll sum it up very shortly for you. School teacher, uh, ex, like, military guy ends up becoming a school teacher at some, like, rundown kind of, as it was in the 90s, a cliche thing, but a rundown, like, kind of inner city school. And he knows Capoeira. So it's like Eddie Gordo, <laughs> in a way. And there's a street gang that sells you drugs to and thing. What's that? You kept the joke I was going to make. So. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the street gang, the leader, well, they all practice Capoeira too. The main leader knows it. And they, there's this big rivalry between the teacher and that, that guy. And it, it gets, it's a good movie. I'd watch it again to this day. Hmm. Okay. Mark Dacascus is in it. He's the main character, if you know who that is. He's, he was in dra- He was in uh, Double Dragon, right? Yeah, damn right. Okay. It's not yeah. a good movie, but all right. <laughs> uh, no, it's not. But, I mean, the guy was in John Wick, like, what, three and other titles like he's been around for quite some time oh, and the only way to watch it or no that's not what i want that's only the strong survive that's a musical that is oh, not what i want to watch online uh, not what we're talking about <laughs> <laughs> so i was trying to see where it's street if it's streaming anywhere and i clicked on one but that was yeah okay that's cool oh, yeah that's shredder that's shredder to me that makes sense i can completely see it from from that picture without knowing anything about the movie <laughs> all right and that's a cool way to put it. And then, like, this comic... So the free issue starts off with Shredder... Not Shredder. Wow. Splinter. I did what you did in one of the earlier, <laughs> earlier <Yeah. laughs> podcast recordings. Splinter kind of giving you a rundown of what happened, which, again, very cool, because if you weren't 
up to date. This is a great way to get you interested enough just to buy the comic and you have enough to go on. Yeah, because you got to think this is a free comic book day. A lot of people might not even be interested in Turtles or it's it's fans of the franchise that haven't gotten to the comics and they, oh, let me get a free Turtle comic. And now they get to get caught up on all the cool moments right here. Yeah, so, this this does a lot of it. It shows their origin story of them being in feudal Japan, them getting beheaded, them being turtles. It has an issue of Secret History of the or a, a, a panel from Secret History of the Foot where they're fighting Shredder. You know, just a lot of cool stuff to get you interested, and then new stuff is fit in between in the issue too. Right. Like showing Splinter taking care of Donatello at the at their at their at their hideout, show, and then it kind of shows the turtles on top of a roof getting ready to beat the shit out of purple dragons that are committing crimes. Yeah, oh, but and Leo reacting on emotion, which is very out of character for him. Yeah, he even brings it up himself. But most importantly, there's one line where I, I have to read to you. One of the panels that shows some stuff from City uh, City Fall, and it says, "Back when those Savante dudes were still around." Mm-hmm. There we go. They reference the idiots. Probably for the last time. <laughs> I want to say I think that's the last time. And this is a free comic book day. So it isn't even like the main series for the most part. No. I mean, in my opinion, you don't even need to read this to, to be with the art. But since you you're following yeah. the timeline and I read everything just about, you know, it even shows, you know, Dark Leo. And when he's a, when he's working for Shredder, it shows that it shows some Savante getting their ass beat because, you know, you got to have that. Good. As they should. You know, it, it shows Casey fighting Hun and how that went. It even shows Alopec standing on top of Raphael. Like, just a lot of cool moments. It talks about the Mutanimals, and it shows stuff with that arc. April in her ghost outfit from Ant-Man and the Wasp. But like, you know, some cool stuff. Mm-hmm. And it, shows, it shows Krang when Shredder fought Krang. It shows stuff leading up to Vengeance with Donnie using, you know, Metalhead metalhead to get them. It, you know, it, it, it gives you a lot of stuff to get really caught up with what's going on. I mean, again, that's the purpose of it. And I really like that, you know, and also seeing Leo act, you know, act without really thinking, you know, letting emotion get to him. And they, they, they attack the purple dragons and, and Hun, which is the only part of this, which is taking place, you know, currently. And I like that. I like how they try to fight Hun and then bludgeon and Alopec show up or not Alopec bludgeon and Koya show up and they're like, fuck it. <laughs> we, you know, and then, then they run because Donnie, sh- I, you know, you get to see Donnie actually kind of fight in the, in the metalhead. I was thinking, like, it's got to be kind of a shock for anybody that isn't familiar with the comics. They're seeing these, yeah. all these different cool character designs as you go throughout the entire book. But, like, and you get to see this, these cool-ass mutants, like, like a, practically a street shark and a falcon. And, and then you get to see Donnie in a robot. And it's like, what the fuck is going on in this comic? Like, if I didn't <laughs> know, like, the build-up, it's like, what the hell? I mean, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it, it, it would definitely, you know take you for a loop that you wouldn't be expecting and it, it would it would get you to want to buy the book i think so i think they, they did a good job on that as far as reeling you in with it yeah and then the last thing you see is shredder and stockman working together as he's building it, it almost looks like shredder's in charge of stockman as they're building the flyborgs and mousers which again that's what it's meant to look like even though we both know that's not the case but it's very very cool right yeah if you didn't know any better that's definitely what it seems to portray yeah, and I mean that's the whole point, right? And that brings us to issue. What is this? Forty-seven, which is the last thing we're gonna we're gonna talk about before our break. And this is kind of, okay. This is kind of a cool cover where you have them fighting flying mousers now and and flyborgs. Right. Yep. And Stockman looking insane, <laughs> all angry like on the in one of the panels on the cover. That's a very Marvel esque cover to me, like picture of him. That's fair. Yeah, it's a cool cover to get you. It definitely gets me more interested in reading this than the other covers have. Best cover this far in the arc. Yeah, that's fair. No, it was definitely cool. All right, and then it cuts to where you have the first page you have is Hun with all the purple dragons and his Zach Daniels whiskey getting ready to fight Alopec. Because he must have stole another bottle, I guess. He keeps getting bottles. Yeah, it's very easy for him to find this shit. That's weird when you're that tough and you have a whole gang. I guess it's not hard. I guess so. He probably doesn't even have to ask. Just give it to him. <laughs> I don't think we have a choice. Looks like he drank a lot, too, in a very short amount of time. Because if you see in the first panel with him, the bottle's full. And then a couple panels down, <laughs> it's going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It probably, I mean, again, he's also on, you know, steroids, but a different kind of steroids. He's not mutant gen. Sure. Steroids. I mean, yeah, his metabolism is, like, 
out of this world, I'm sure. And there's that another another broken bottle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very quickly too. <laughs> but at the same, you have a cool part where April's dad tells him to call nine one one, and I like that, which again pays off. But like when you see them getting ready to fight, I, one guy has a fucking Uzi. Everybody's got like you know bats and chains, and one guy's got a fucking Uzi. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then before Hun breaks that bottle that you were talking about, he takes a few swigs of the bottle before it gets broken. Oh yeah. Like gulp, sure. you just see gulp, 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 gulp. Like I got some use out of it, man. Like I, I'm drinking hard liquor. I could not. Well, again, I'm also not a steroid, you know, giant man. So there's that too. But like that's, that, that shit don't go down easy. <laughs> uh, not that easy. Again, I drink stuff on the rocks these days, but it's <laughs> I couldn't do what he's doing consistently. No, but <laughs> also neither of us are alcoholic, so there's that too. Right or steroid fucking freak. Yes, which I'm sure plays a big part in that. Both of those things. I'm sure. But it's just it was just cool to see. <laughs> and then one really important thing that happens that I didn't catch the first time is that you you see the guy from the liquor store that he helped out that he gave the cricket bat to says, I got to return a favor and goes outside to help with the fight. And oh yeah, this is what you thought more. Casey ends up kicking him, kicks Hun and breaks the bottle right on Hun. Yeah. And there goes the liquor. I like how he's like, oops, looks like you spilled again. No one likes a sloppy drunk. <laughs> mm-hmm. It just it's just cool. And then you find out like when. When Hun is about to beat the shit out of him, they distract him by the guy with the cricket bat hits him in the back of the head. Which I feel like is affecting Hun a lot more because Hun's drunk and not himself, not as strong as normal. Because that shouldn't yeah, affect I him. So right, I mean, because he's gotten in fights with Bebop and Rocksteady, and yeah, Bludgeon and Slash, or Slash especially, and Slash is like out of everybody we just mentioned, the biggest powerhouse out of all. He's probably one of the strongest characters we've been introduced <clears throat> to on the regular where we're at so far i i would say like mutant like strength wise probably throughout the whole damn series into where i'm at oh damn uh, like slash is is up there he's a badass and i call april dad has a toaster and they actually have him use a toaster because again the joke earlier in one of the other arcs we talked about he couldn't get the toaster to work and he just throws the fucking toaster at some thug and hits him in the face that was a nice <laughs> little reference there and I like how one guy called her called Alapex a puppy dog, and then they have he gets his ass just bit by the dog or the wolf. Yeah, was, uh, nobody says she bites, and she's sitting there on this guy's leg, looking absolutely evil yet again. Yeah, they love drawing her like that. They do. And you have Casey handing a baseball bat to April's dad when he gets a hockey stick out to fight Han. You have some neighbors who look like tough guys are like, okay, you know, we're gonna, you see a bunch of people leave their apartments to go help fight the purple dragon. And I think that is really cool to see. So yeah, it, it's, I like, I actually like what they're doing here because they don't really Same. do it in the series before or after this, but just the unification of people just that have just had enough of others doing wrong to them and their community. And they're, they're fuck this. Something's got to change. And they're fighting they're people that they can beat. These aren't, you know, ninjas that are going to like just cut them to pieces. You know, these are just a bunch of thugs. Yeah, the they're not are mostly thugs. killers or assassins or thieves or yeah, I mean, like, nothing yeah. compared to what the foot is. Right. So you can get a community out there. I mean, you got to think, too, though, like you got Casey out here just kind of leading the charge and and somebody's got to help this guy. Like, why why are we sitting back being useless? Whereas this guy's taking on what is to, to the average citizen an army. As, and you, you even have a comment to throw back. The one, the woman who lost her groceries hitting, a, hitting Link over the head with a rolling pin, you know, because she, she wants new groceries. Right. And I like how all the purple dragons run away and leave Hun there. Like, they just all abandoned him. <laughs> and is this when he says... Or no, oh, way earlier when he said that, you know, now he can, they can be, they can, he can now work together with Casey because the hit is over. Because Shredder's dead. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to mention that quick. But it was just really damn cool. Like this was a really cool scene, and you actually, and then you see the police for the first fucking time in one of, in these comics. I feel like because the police are never around. Um, yes, it's very rare. <laughs> you saw it during you saw them during the Sabate art you, or arc. You don't remember that? Mm, no, I don't. But well, you didn't you didn't read that annual, right? No, I didn't. That's the one thing I skipped. Okay. Well, there's a lot of cop shit in there that suck. <laughs> well, the black and white like noir. And you told yeah, me. This. So, oh God, man! I know you don't regret it. <laughs> I didn't actually. That's the one I didn't read. I've read every issue so far of this art of this comic, but I did not read that one issue. So, Great, that's something because it took me probably a couple months to get through it because I hated it so much. Uh, but I like how the officers show up and then they actually arrest Hun. Like I thought that was really cool. That guy could rip out of those damn cuffs. He's breaking pavement. 
Oh yeah, no, I mean they should just shoot him. But well, yeah, they'll blast him if he tries to to do anything. I do like what Hunt says though. When uh, Purple Dragons take off, he compares Casey to him, and they do things the Jones way. With oh yeah, pretty much fighting when things don't go their way and a problem comes up, even if it's each other, they deal with it the the way they do, and that's fighting their way through it. And he also um, makes and, a comment how those guys are, you know, a dime a dozen. You can just find any thugs and give them money and promise them more, and it'll work for you. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, and what Han says actually really like digs deep into Casey, and he's like, hey, he's not completely fucking wrong here, you know? Not at all. And it's very cool. Just, yeah, but yeah, you're right. He could easily broken out of those cops. I was surprised they just arrested him. I'm like, really? Like you're just gonna arrest? Like, okay, cool. But I like how one one of the cops like, yo, Detective Lewis, I swear I just saw a giant white fox and uh stop stop right there, Johnson. We got enough. Yeah. We got hun, that's enough. Yeah, shut that thing down. <laughs> I like that. Well again, it makes sense. I mean they you know, there's this got I mean, I'm sure, you know, she's seen other weird shit happening in the city at this point. Well there are random mutants running around. Mm-hmm. And then, anything else end, is more says, paperwork. Yeah, uh, and, and I knew I know too many cops in my personal life and one thing they don't like doing is definitely paperwork that is not a cliche that is real <laughs> they, <laughs> they hate it <sighs> that's fair it would just pull it i just thought it was funny and then then it cuts to the turtles and they're looking at the scroll that april took which i am i am excited to hear to, to learn more about the gods i really am well this is it this is the the liftoff point for where we really start getting more into it as you'll see with with casey and april and, and we'll, you, as you know what's coming with that eventually for that to be the biggest overarching storyline in the, in the series. So. Okay. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Like you, you have them, you know, looking at, you know, they even asked, you know, Splinter, like, should we destroy the scroll? And he's like, not this one. And you see a picture of the bull guy, which again, no reference to. And, and Leo points out something about the weird. He's like, check out that rat dude, bro. Yeah. Weird. Like hey, that, that, that scroll, by the way, you see, you see the eye of whatnot. The eye doesn't really have too much significance yet or maybe at all i don't I, as far as where i'm at I, I don't know much about that it could just be a symbol but notice that there are other there's three others at least on the right side that you can tell yeah and, you know just oh, that's all you can see so and one of them near the top looks like a dragon go keep reading <laughs> well you know i'm going <laughs> <sighs> just, but, i'm just opening your eyes no pun intended with the damn scroll but opening your eyes to <laughs> Just how big this really can get. And this is also, I think, kind of the point where, like, as April even <clears throat> says, it, you know, breaks over and they're going to go, her and Casey are going to go and try to find out more about these gods. Yeah. Which is the which is the miniseries that takes place after this arc. And I'm glad they, they brought it up now. I, I think it was important for them to, to get the next storyline kind of roll in that bridge, because that's what that acts like. That April and Casey's story is, is a bridge to the next not only the next big arc but to the biggest overarching arc in the in the series and if this you know if this thing has taught me anything you can't none of you can't take anything for granted like for these these mini series they're all part of the run every damn story mm-hmm. so it it, it was ghostbusters <laughs> yeah no i mean that played a big part i mean i haven't felt the you know what really is coming but yeah definitely going to be a part of it and then it cuts back to to you know the foot clan you have karai and this is when shredder shows up for the first time and they find out he's alive and bring he brings stockman with him ruts right back in <laughs> and he's, he's pissed at karai for taking over or what i don't really know but i know he's angry at her yeah, so. that's because it's kind of how he treats her in general I, I don't know if he's really pissed at her about anything he just in specific he's an asshole <laughs> he doesn't always agree they don't always agree i mean as you can see Right. That's one thing that pisses him off. She's questioning some of his decisions, and nobody ever should question Shredder's decisions. So that's that's something he's contesting with her. She even realizes she's like, "Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be saying this or not." And she does it again right after that. I mean, that happens in in real life too. I mean, you've, we've had idiot people in power that are like, "How dare you question that? I want you know forty Big Macs. How dare you know?" You have idiots like like any anybody who's in power of any sort should always have people you need to have advisors around you that can quit that can you know like hey this don't make sense buddy like you just need that sure in in this case shredder is capable shredder he, he doesn't do things her way and and she obviously is contesting that but shredder is still capable with or without karai he's getting shit done yeah he's trusting outsiders she is absolutely against it she's pointing fingers at stockman again Saying is an outsider, which yes, he technically is, but Shredder is a master manipulator. That is something Karai 
knows nothing about or not enough about. No, and she she doesn't really completely understand what's happening either with some of the stuff with Shredder. Like she doesn't understand why Stock he just brings in this random scientist. He doesn't explain anything. He doesn't say, "Hey, this guy saved my fucking life." Like I owe him like nothing. Just and even and he says the name of the arc. He's like, "This is vengeance." Oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> You know, because he essentially hires Stockman to kill Splinter to get revenge. Yeah, that's because what he, he exactly was. He really blames Splinter for what happened with Krang, and I mean, it wasn't even them. I mean, yes, they were setting him up, but not for what, not the way it worked out. Well, yeah, because you got to think, if it wasn't for the turtles, all well, Shredder might be dead still. <laughs> the, the well, yeah, the turtles wouldn't have stopped Krang; they all be dead. Right. So, but either way, is there issue for not? Allowing Krang to be killed and all that kind of shit, too. But then again, I don't even think Shredder knows what happened with Krang in this case. No, I don't think they realize how close they came to death. Well, I, as far as, like, Krang being arrested, I don't think they know. Anybody but the Turtles know that. Yeah. And after, and then you oh. see Stockman put on that fucking helmet and look like a psychopath. Right, yeah. <laughs> You do have a cool two-page spread of showing, like, of the Flyborgs and Mousers leaving the TCRI building and then the cop being like, what the fuck is they see, you know, all these things flying in the sky. You have Angel and Alapex looking up, seeing it. April's parents looking up and seeing it, you, you know, as they're just flying over the city. And they know where the Going straight are. to the church, yeah. I'm trying to think when they find... I don't think they ever found out where the lair was, but I guess they knew somehow. Well, they know. I don't remember how... I don't think... Because they wouldn't have been there like, if no. they knew, I feel like. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how that works in this case. So, but it, it's it's awesome. Like you just see the. It really reminds me of the 2003 cartoon where they're sitting in they're in their lair, and all of a sudden the mousers just break through and the flyborgs, and they all just keep saying, you know, kill the rat. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and like how you know Raphael's like, it ain't Don there after, and you just keep seeing in four different bubbles, kill the rat, kill the rat. Like yeah, it's awesome. This does remind me a lot of uh, the Mirage Run when they first. Yeah, got in the uh, mousers and they busted in the lair and all that. I, I think that's obviously what they were going for. Oh yeah, 100%. but in this case, they they upped the ante. Now you got flying mousers, the mousers 2.0, and then these crazy fucking flyboards. So yeah, <laughs> nice kind of throwback there in a way. And I I like the flying mousers. I think that that's a nice upgrade because you had mousers in the early part of this, but we didn't have, and now we have them with freaking you know they're able to fly. So up the ante. Yeah, I mean, it's, it makes sense, right? Like, why get rid of a design that mostly worked when you can just make it better? Yeah, it was surprisingly cool. And, and this is when I got to this point. I think I read the next three issues all in one night. I was like, fuck it, I'm, I'm, I can't stop. <laughs> I, yeah, Vengeance takes some interesting, interesting ways it goes. Oh, yeah. And then we just got 48, 49, and 50 left to talk about. Well, we are going to take a short break. A short break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so after the break we will come back and then we will finish the vengeance so stay tuned and we're back from the break and we're going to continue talking about vengeance and we're going to starting with issue 48 so rich what did you think of this cover because this cover got my attention when i first saw it this cover here it, it kind of shows the epicness and chaos of of what's to come. Pretty badass. I love Don down there with the laser. Uh, it's great. It, it really is. These last three issues are really intense, too. Like, if I if I went to Lost World and I saw this cover sitting there, <laughs> and, it definitely would have got my attention. That, that's a that's a Milwaukee cut for those that are listeners that are in Milwaukee and Southside. Uh, the store's still around, though, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I was actually just in there with my coworker, um, Earlier uh, last week, I like that place. I'll have to go there again sometime. Whenever I'm in Milwaukee, I always I always like to stop there at least once. Yeah, it was it was kind of nice to go there, man. You know, I've, I I kind of traveled around uh, off topic, obviously. We traveled around with my coworker for you know, for our job, and uh, I I showed him a few like game stores that I knew of, and out of all of them, actually, Lost World was still the best one out of, out of each one. Like each one kind of had their own specialties. But Lost World had the most variety and, and interesting things going on. Yeah, it's a really nice store. In fact, so many memories, though, whenever I go back there, you know, we used to play Rifts in the back room. Yep, that I don't think they use anymore, do they? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I just stop in, buy Every time I go, I usually look and maybe I'll buy I'll usually buy a comic of some sort. I remember uh, when one of our friends would steal Rift books. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> That's what happened back then. And then he got kicked out. What? Yep. 
(laughs) (laughs) Issue 48 starts off because the last issue ended with them getting attacked with the turtles getting attacked. And like, it's the first panel is them in their hideout with Donnie in a bed. And you just see flying mousers and fly borgs just in the air above them. It's pretty epic. Yeah. They're, they're swarming down. I mean, the pressure is on at this point and all they could do is just, as Splinter says, just defend themselves. I mean, they also really think that they're there to kill Donatello or kill them, but they're really just there to kill the rat because Shredder is being so focused on one thing, which is kill Kamado Yoshi. That's all he cares about. So he's ignoring the fact that, like, you, if you were smarter, you would take out the turtles. And that would be your Well, focus. yeah, and one of them's vulnerable. If they would have went straight for Don, I mean, he's not. he, he can do himself. To, I mean, for at this second, at least, he can't defend himself because his robot body's not around. Yeah, he's in a different place. And it's pretty, it's just epic. And, like, you really see the turtles getting beaten down in this, too. In this fight, you can get beat down multiple in the, with left of this arc, but you know they're hurting. You know, like the, you also see some cool scene. You actually, this is I gotta say, this arc, especially this last part of the arc, actually makes Michelangelo's nunchucks cool for a change. So that was nice. Yeah, Mikey uh, tends to whip a little ass in this arc. Yeah, and you can actually, and since they're fighting robots, they can actually use their weapons. <laughs> well, and kill things. as we'll see as we go on, their weapons will actually be used on uh, other people. <laughs> But you don't see that as much. Like, you see a Flyborg in one of the early panels mis- had, like, a o- couple arms cut off because Leo sliced them. Mm-hmm. I-, I just like that. I like seeing them actually use their weapons. He's cutting a, a mouser in half, a flying mouser in yeah. one of these panels. Just cool stuff. And then, I think, yeah, eventually, the after they defeat what they have, then they, they run away with... Because they realize they're after the rat because they keep saying, kill the rat, kill the rat. So, you know, they put two and two together. Oh, they want to kill Splinter. So they... They run away deep into the tunnels to try to get them away from Donatello's body. And and Leo, at this point, he shines again by calling an audible and, and making a, a logical plan in the heat of the moment, in the heat of battle. So uh, I really like that they gave him some more leadership building in, in, that, in that case. Yeah, they, they do a good job with Leo in this a lot. This arc in general did a lot of good stuff for Leo, I felt. I think Leo's at his strongest now. I mean, you saw him when he got brainwashed, went over the foot, and he recovered even more so, better than he was before the foot. Yeah, for sure. I and mean, I like how they, they do keep that trauma there, too, because it will come up later on. Like, it doesn't, you know, it, it didn't, he didn't, because again, you don't just recover from trauma like that. Right. Like, it sticks with you. And it, I'm assuming it's going to stick with him for a long time throughout the series, I'm guessing. Because that would make sense. But we'll see. <laughs> And then finally, Donatello, well, in shellhead form, shows up. And then I like how he teleports his, his regular body away because he has Future Joy take it to Bernal Island with it kind of taken over at this point. And I like that. This has some very interesting parts to it that, that happened that we'll talk about shortly. But, like, I wasn't expecting where this was going to go when they teleport him or what was going to show up. Did not expect that. Mm-hmm. You know, but, and, and I think also then you see... No, this is when you 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 have the police who arrested Hunt in the last issue, and they're driving. And this is when. So I didn't understand this. The mutanimals break out Hunt. This is this is true. Yeah, <laughs> I don't understand why. Because they say we need your help with something to get us in somewhere, and they said you'll know what we're talking about, and they drive off. Well, and then that's the last we see of it. So that's something that's going to get picked up as we go. Okay, I'm assuming that's probably next arc or the arc after or something. Right. I know the next arc because the cover of issue 51 has the mutanimals on it. So I know that they're coming back. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I looked that up. I haven't read anything. Yeah, but I looked so, it up. I, again, so not only are we closing the biggest arc of the series so far, or one of the most important arcs of the series so far, but they're still planting seeds for the stuff to come. So that's just good planning, good writing. And I like how the cops like, yeah, she's like, that surprised me. She did not expect a bunch of mutants to break out, you know, hun. I didn't expect a bunch of mutants to break out, hun, either. <laughs> I mean, there is one funny comment where Hobbs like, where oh yeah, where Hunt says, you know that big turtle of yours hates my guts, right? And Hobbs like, why do you think I didn't bring him? <laughs> yep, I like that. And no That's Pete. Nice to see of him. Where's yeah, Pete? Yeah, no Pete. I don't know. It's, it's almost I like think he, about that. You wouldn't want to bring Pete on a mission, huh? Hmm. I mean, he's done it before, and Pete has actually held his own. <laughs> <laughs> Pete is uh, trained in small firearms. <laughs> <laughs> And right before this, you have a small scene where oh, Alopex and nobody start heading to go help out the turtles that are being attacked by the mousers and everything. And then you have an interesting scene here where it then goes to Shredder's hideout. And you have Shredder talking with her name's Kitsune, right? 
Kitsune. Kitsune. And she she's interesting in this. Like, I didn't understand what was going on exactly. Because she's plotting for sure. You see this throughout this. This is She is the first character of the Pantheon that we really get to see in more detail. Especially in the next big arc coming. Uh, it has a lot to do with her. But she's the first one that we really get introduced to until you see how that evolves. That expands uh, with her family. Okay. And I'm excited for that. I, I, my assumption, as we'll get to as this, as we continue this, is that they're going to be the next like villain for a while because you put away the rest of them. So, well, you got to think about this. I mean, they they've never stopped. So they they were villains before time of the turtles, and they'll be villains forever, being that they are demigods. So, yeah, but I mean, like the villains that are going to take center stage for the book. It That's takes my guess. Time. <laughs> it takes its time, sure, yeah. That's just how I assume where things are going based on what I've seen so far. But I also have not read past issue 50 because I try not to. <laughs> I stop. Once we get to a point, I stop. I do not read next till we finish. Now, you had a, you had a bit before you're picking this up again. It's, uh, I know, unfortunately. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a little while. It sucks. <laughs> but we'll see. But no, you get hurt. There's just a couple of comments she makes. Like she calls Shredder her beloved, which she does. In other points, but to hear it felt very much like it was the meaning in a sense, because I feel like she's up to it. She could give a shit about him at this point. Yeah, you got to think. I mean, I think she does to an extent, but with her, she's like almost as old as time. So how, how significant could Shredder truly be to her? I guess there's only certain things uh, in the next big arc. You'll see what kind of role her relationship played with him even more. So there's that. And you'll, you'll probably come back to this point once we get that far in the story. Okay. Now I look forward to seeing, cause they're like earlier, I forget how it, it's been a few arcs, but there was a issue where Kitsune was, you know, telling Alapex, you need to come back and like had a plan set up for her. And then nothing has come of that until it's in this arc where that's kind of mentioned a bit again, but you don't ever see nothing actually happened with it. Like, you know, whatever her plan is, but you just see the fact that her plan is still going. So I thought that definitely has my interest. Like, the stuff with Baxter also, mm -hmm. like, to really put, like, it really divides Karai and Shredder because Shredder is aligning himself with this mad scientist. Right, and and there's a couple things here with all that. So when it comes to Kitsune and the Pantheon, anything that you see with them is going to be the slowest build in the entire series, just because it's meant to be the background overarching story of the entire series so it's going to be the slowest build ever like okay a little hints there here there here expect that to happen but shredder and karai you you gotta it's an interesting dynamic what they've come up with because you gotta think shredder killed an entire family because he saw them as insubordinates and his own granddaughter is now showing insubordination more than one occasion so does he kill her? Does he not? I mean, it's, there's a lot of, like, how does he handle the situation? Because now it's blood. And the woman that actually put uh, resurrected him, technically speaking. Because if it wasn't for Karai, he'd still be rotten somewhere in that, that ooze. Yeah, because it wasn't her blood or something, too, that resurrects him, if I remember correctly? It is, yeah. She, I think she cut her hand. And, yeah. yeah. Which so I that's just... maybe one, one reason why he doesn't behead her or do what he wants to. <laughs> And I think Kasun kind of, like, especially a little bit later on, pushes him not to. She's like, listen to what she has to say. She does, and you, and you you see it. Like, even her face and these panels here where they're staring at Baxter and talking about Baxter, they even draw her in a very conniving, like, sneaky way. She's manipulative. Yeah. More so than anybody in this comic, she is the master manipulator. Just the way that they, when she says beloved, the way that they draw her face, mm -hmm. the smile, it looks, it just... There's, it's just, it's very sneering, is how I took it. She's plotting. I mean, this is all again to her, and it shows. Oh, I do look forward to seeing more of the stuff that goes on with them. That's for sure. So that has me very excited. <laughs> and then Donnie shows up in shellhead form uh, and helps out the turtles and blows up a bunch of rats, or not rats, but the flyboards, which I thought was cool. I like that. And then I like how they go through the water where they have to go swimming, and then Donnie just makes turns himself into a boat for... For Splinter, why the rest just got to swim. Right. <laughs> oh, that was funny. And I think somebody makes a comment like, yeah, I'm going to need a bath. I took a bath. After, I need another bath after this. Sewer water. Yeah. Uh, and it's just funny. It's just, you know, they add a little bit of comedy where they can. And 
you know, the turtles are on the run. I still don't, as I brought up earlier, I still don't understand how they found they knew the church was the base, but that's neither here nor there, but it did bother me. Yeah, I, if we dug enough, we could probably figure that out. I'm, just, yeah. you know, I'm sure a small detail we might have overlooked, or they just fucked that up. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> or like, yeah, they're smart. They figured it out. But, like, when, when the turtles get attacked in the river by the flyboards and stuff, like, you see them almost lose. You know, they, yeah, they're, they're trying to drown the them. Like, there, yeah. I, think, I think Leo, Leo has to save Raphael, like, you know, I think oh, Raphael's one almost gets taken out, it looks like. You know, the colors look wrong on here. In the panel where Leo is bringing him out, I swore it looks like that bandana's orange, not red. It, it does. I, and I would assume just because they're underwater, it kind of dinges it. I I don't know. It just looked weird to me. It's like, hmm. it, it does look orange. Yeah. But I couldn't see the front of it because I know each of them have a little bit of a difference in their bandanas in the front on their face sometimes. Well, you can see he's got his thigh underneath the water there and... A couple panels later, Leo's bringing him up. And then yeah, Mike, so you know it's... Rough yeah, now. Mikey's like jumping from way up high and cannonballing. So <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't him. But I just thought that was cool. Like, just to show how they're doing. And then when they get on the bridge and they're fighting more, Alapex and Angel show up. And they're still like, you know, they're just not doing good. Like, the last page of this of this issue is them just standing on a bridge surrounded by mousers and flyborgs. And they... Maybe could have fought their way out of it, but it would have been a hell of a fight, a lot of damage done. They might not have been able to withstand what's coming up if yeah. Angel and uh, Alapex didn't show up when they did. And like, also, I like how Mike Angel makes comedy like <laughs> saying they're going to need more of those robot bodies. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, again, I mean, this is, you know, they're outnumbered. It looks like they're not going to make it. So, like, when I went into this, you had told me there was a big thing ha- <laughs> over two years ago. You told me there was a big thing happening in issue 50. So that was always in the back of my mind. And I was thinking, okay, is, is Splinter going to die? Is one of the turtles going to die? Well, I knew not the turtles going to die, I, but I thought Splinter was going to die. That was my going into this. Like, that's what's coming. That's just what I thought. And especially oh, when yeah, this, nice, when, when that page nice ended, <laughs> that's what I thought too. Oh, that, oh yeah. And I got a surprise. That's for sure. Uh, you, you thought he was going to die at this point. Yeah. Well, also I, I try to behave myself and not look at any future stuff. Or like even like, I mean, every so often I do see covers that people post of, issues and like i know about the yellow turtle way way later on i mean i know of some stuff but I, as i think about it i never see splinter in any covers so i'm mm. like they could kill splinter like they could do that and i'm like all right so that was in the back of my mind what was coming and i remember reading these issues kind of like oh, i hope they don't kill splinter and i just kept reading everything so <laughs> that was always in the back of my mind and that brings us to issue 49 which this covers all right it's not as cool as the other one but it fits the style of of these covers for this arc where it's, you know, at the top part is Karai holding a box in the middle part is them. is the turtles fighting. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's passable. It's nothing special. And then, well, then you got shredder and, uh, Mato Yoshi right in the middle. I thought that was kind of cool touch there in their human form. Yeah. Which you don't see very often. <laughs> well, I mean, again, that's what this whole arc is about. You know, it's just not yeah. what I thought it was going to be. And then the, this, this issue starts off with, you have, Akoya and Bludgeon getting upset with Rocksteady and Bebop, but they're just watching TV and eating a whole bunch. They're being children. Yes, because like they are children. 600, 800 pound children. Indestructible children, yes. That I don't know how the hell they're sitting on a couch, but yeah. <laughs> the couches do look broken, though, from in this. They do. I mean, maybe before they sat on it, but I don't know how they hold them. <laughs> Well, I just like how Bludgeon and, and, and Akoya judge them. Because, again, these are humans that were that were then kind of turned, given animal powers versus animals that were then given human bodies, essentially. You know, humanoid bodies. And, you know, it's just they're just so different. And they're, you know, loyal to their master where Bebop and Rocksteady are still just fucking dumbasses. Uh, I thought that was interesting. I do like that take on that to kind of show that, like, distrust of them, too. Right. You know, they're, kind of, they're pretty much untrained, whereas... And you got to think, like... Legend and Koya were under the supervision of Shredder, whereas Karai had Bebop and Rocksteady made through their process, and you see the difference. And they got some really dumbass recruits. And it's sad that the two humans that were turned into mutant animals are dumber than the actual animals. Yeah, I mean they're really fucking stupid. <laughs> uh, they're not. But again, look where they came. Look where they came from. They came from the '87 cartoon, so right. you know they fit how they should be. I think. It wouldn't be right if they didn't make them stupid. I mean, that's kind of half their charm. I mean, that's also the that's the eighty seven cartoon for you. Hey, did you go back? Try to go back and watch that as an adult and see how it goes. 
Yeah, no. <laughs> it won't go well. He'll get one episode in and be like, fuck, this is terrible. I believe it. Oh, you're made for a different era. I had a different age group. <laughs> yes. It wasn't made for 35-year-olds. <laughs> so. Not at all. <laughs> I would try to go back and watch some of it. I'm like, nope, turn it off real quick. Uh, I, so I did, I did like this part. When you have the turtles surrounded, Baxter's about to finish them off, and then the foot shows up and just starts destroying the flyboards and you know, mousers and you have Baxter just get furious with him because he thinks Shredder sent the ninjas to go do it. And then, and Shredder realizes real quick who it was all in capitals. <laughs> Cry. Mm-hmm. How else are they going to, who are they going to listen to to go besides yeah. them? It's going to be Cry. I like this. I think it's really cool. If they show up and that they, they save them because she's trying to be honorable and what they were doing. She, she considered it unhonorable. You know, so it was just, it was. And, and that's, that's her, greatest strength and weakness at the same time i mean to accomplish goals it's not helping her at all but that's the thing with shredder i guess it just shows his his honor and everything like that he has not it, it's just a, a means to an end and that's it yeah i mean as we saw in the turtles in time comic where he's like he tries to stab leo in the back and leo has a shout he's like he tried to do it a lot don't you you know yeah it's just kind of it's kind of his thing it's his trademark he's a crooked fighter he doesn't give a shit he's just like i'm gonna kill you i don't care if how i'm gonna do it but i'm gonna kill you as long as he overcomes at the end of the day, he doesn't give a shit how yeah. he does it. And that really shows with him. So. And that's, I mean, another reason why Hamato Yoshi had so many issues with him, too. Yeah. But I, I just like it when Karai shows up and I think they're ready to fight her. And Splinter's like, we we'll listen to what she has to say, you know. Yeah, and he tells them to stand down. Like, they didn't want to lower their weapons. and But he knew what he was doing. I mean, they were well, outnumbered anyway. Think, like, Splinter has already planted the seed of doubt in her issues ago. So... He already knows that she's already doubting her, her leadership and he's going to take full advantage of her right now while he can. Because, I mean, if it wasn't as bad as it is already, I mean, look, she showed up and helped them out and they, when they could have died. So he's going to have her ear. Yeah, it was the second technical drum when he plants that bug in her ear about mm-hmm. Shredder not being not thinking about the foot just himself. So I thought that was really cool. And I, I don't remember. So that, yeah, they have a little bit of them talking and then it cuts back to the techno drum. And you see, I like the panel where the Technodrome was all, like, covered in, like, some kind of, like, rot or something or rust from being in that different, in the different dimension that he created for the Utrams. I like that a lot. Being in that atmosphere. Yeah, what I don't understand is why the Utrams are still in stasis, because they should be able to live in that island. Like, why not just take them out of stasis? Yeah, I don't know. I'm... I guess he doesn't give a shit, because it's not his people. <laughs> he doesn't want to kill them, but he doesn't care about, you know, releasing them. You're talking about Fugitoid? Yeah, oh, no, he doesn't want those people to... He doesn't even know how they are. For To him, he thinks probably most Utrons are just like Krang. Yeah. And, I mean, that's the least of his worries. They're so preoccupied with trying to save a friend of theirs that those Utrons can wait. Yeah, I like how they, they built a new shell for Donatello, too. I'm assuming there's, like, more to that shell that will come up later, that it's not normal shell, I'm assuming. Well, it's not. I mean, I don't know what alloy they use, but they made his shell that way, and then his bow staff is just later. And those are two cool upgrades that I wanted you to see, too. I never wanted to bring it up to you, but if you notice on future covers, that bow staff is reflected on those covers. I did not, because I tried not to look too closely at <laughs> anything, but I'm going to pay attention now. They wouldn't yeah, have he told it. you much. It was like, oh, he just gets a new weapon, but you wouldn't have known how no. that he came close to fucking death for that to happen. But I thought it was a real nice touch that, why didn't they do this earlier? They could have gave him some type of metal bow staff a long time ago. So, And then the shell thing, I thought it was a really cool touch. I really liked that they did that. Same. I like how Fugitoid is having a you know a moral dilemma. He's like, well, I can save Lee, I can save Donatello, but I have to take this Ooze and the Utron, which just pro- could kill them. And I don't want to kill them, you know, to say if you know, it doesn't feel right. And all of a sudden, this random green alligator arm shows up and offers him more ooze and alligator yep. tail. And I got excited. <laughs> yep, I got uh, really he excited. Does, he does have a big role, by the way. I really role. like Leatherhead. I didn't want to say anything, but now that oh. you're you're just getting those hints now. I knew he was in this because the, the timeline thing you sent us, there's an arc in a few issues called Leatherhead. So I knew he was coming. Sure, but we didn't we also see him in uh, Turtles in Time? You see an alligator in, in the pit with ooze, but you don't, that's all you see, but yeah, I knew. Oh, it was okay, well, yeah, well it's like, go. like, come that on. That was the first appearance. Yeah, so I've been excited for this ever since. Because I really, I don't know why I like Leatherhead so much, I just do. He's just one of those characters I've always liked. Yeah, it's just a 
cool design. So you technically haven't even seen his his design in this yet. No, because all you see is an arm and a tail, and that and that's it. You actually don't even see him again in this art in these two pages nope. or two pages. That's two really books. it. So well, I would have. You see his you see his arm again, right? But that's about it. Yeah, I mean, I know who it is because I'm a big turtles well, fan. So his design, I, I think you're gonna like it when it, when you do finally see the whole thing. It's a pretty nice one. Okay, I'm I'm looking forward to it. And then after this, you have Baxter being all pissed. And okay, this is when then Karai shows back up and dest- I, she destroys his computer console with an arrow. I like that. I thought that was cool. Well, this whole time I was wondering when Shredder is going to almost say "shut the fuck up" because Baxter is sitting here practically disrespecting Shredder. Talking a lot of shit to this guy. Yeah, he's helping him out. Yeah, he saved his life. That's not somebody you talk to like that. <laughs> no. <laughs> and Baxter was getting very arrogant. And Shredder's finally had enough. He's like, all right, whatever happened, you would do well to control your tongue. And I he like was, that. He didn't say it with any emotion. Let him know, like, one more fucking time, you're done. <laughs> I'm going to murder you. And at this point, and I almost wanted to see it, because Baxter's such an arrogant, snivelly little fuck at this point. I almost <laughs> wanted to see it. But as you, as you said, Karai shows up and uh, kind of all shit breaks loose. I'm also assuming Baxter's going to play a bigger part in the coming issues, too. Well, you got your main villains in this. Besides your Pantheon, you got your Shredder, you got your Baxter, you have Crane. You got your main villains that have been known to Turtle history. So just think about most of those villains and, and what they'll mean for the series as you go forward. There's usually going to be a plan for each and every one. I'm I'm excited. It's gonna be a little bit, unfortunately, before we get back to this. But I'm looking forward to it because I'm I'm all in in general with this damn book, as you should be. <laughs> but when Cry does show up, and I mean Shredder's just pissed because he he knows that they did you know they did something, so he's ready just to execute her right then and there for disobedient. But it, it's Kitsune that tells him to listen to what she has to say and saves her life. So yeah, I like that. You know, and, and I think what she says that they're going to do some kind of ancient dispute to honor. I forget what it's called. I'm trying to look for the word. You mean with him and Karai you're talking about? Yeah, with the turtles, whatever oh. that thing they're going to do oh, is. Oh, the, the gauntlet, yeah. The gauntlet, yeah, that was the word I was looking for, yeah. And I like how when she's saying this, and you just see the one panel of Shredder's where he just is in shock when all of a sudden he realizes the turtles and Splinter are all there and Alapex and Angel with the, with the yeah, foot his... that she brought him. Pupilless <laughs> eyes, <laughs> yeah, wide open uh, at the sight of what's in front of them, which should be. And you got to think they're standing in the middle of an army of foot soldiers, and that that too has to be a bit shocking to him to even see that. But they're also loyal to Karai in a sense. They are. I mean, if Shredder said, well, he did say he <laughs> would kill them, but that's when Kitsune comes around, and I'm guessing that that god like power, that demigod power, she she had to use some in order to kind of persuade him I'm yeah guessing. the couple there's a couple times in this where you see this orange glow surround kitsune and in the panel but i'm pretty sure nobody else can see it it's just supposed to be she's using her powers to manipulate him and to convince him to be like yeah you should go along with this because he's like fuck your gauntlet i'll just murder you all <laughs> you know he has no honor and, and pay, pay attention like to this, this line after all what does the great dragon warrior have to fear because the Dragon Warrior is the reincarnation of that guy from the Secret History of the Foot, right? So, as you go along, we'll see more and more about that. Okay. And then Baxter just leaves. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I'll just I was at all him saying, fuck this. I'm out of here. Yeah, he picked the right time to get the hot air. That was the time. Because he, who knows what would have happened if he would have stayed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't think things would have ended well for him. And just like, so then they, they, they get up to pair up to do the gauntlet, which <clears> is a four versus four fight before then whoever's left can help you fight, you know, like if whoever won from Shredder's team would then fight, you know, Splinter and then the Turtles fight with Splinter to fight Shredder, but, you know, and no. I think this is interesting too, because Karai is ready to be in this fight, but Shredder doesn't want Karai. He just wants Bludgeon, Koya, Bebop, and Rocksteady, which, you know, he wants his monsters essentially to be the ones fighting. And I think that's interesting. Also, he's so pissed at Karai, but there's also one line with Kitsune right before the fight starts. He says, a binding covenant signed in blood and sealed in death. Because I think she wants him to, to get rid of Shredder for her. For her. I, that's all I took it. Again, some of the wording same. in here is subliminal. And you'll see later on why. Okay. I'm, 
I'm excited. But there's like a two page spread of just the turtles on one side and the mutants on the other, mutants and shredder on the other, and it's just it's a badass page. That's cool. It's it's definitely that stood out to me when I first read this. I thought there was one badass kind of scene right there. And I for sure thought somebody on the hero side is gonna die when I was reading this. And with this being vengeance and with me knowing that there was some big twist in issue fifty, I was like, somebody's dead. And you were still waiting for Shredder to die, <laughs> or Splinter to die. I was waiting for Splinter to die. I'm like, Splinter's yeah. dead. That's what I thought a hundred percent. It was going through my head. I actually read these two issues or these three issues in one night because I I couldn't put this down. I'm like, I can't go to bed. I gotta finish this damn arc. I don't blame you. It's it's damn good. Uh, uh-huh. I'm in a turtles group, and every so often I see them post stuff for the IDW comics. And every time I do, I usually post a link to our to our conversation that we've been doing with these turtle comments I'm like these fucking things are so damn good like you were in for a treat <sighs> you really are and then i like how when they're getting ready to do the fight because the object because i think oh yeah where splinter even says no one no my son only saki or i must die today michael angelo asked for the goal to kill each other yeah because he's one that cannot stand death at all yeah. or even violence for that matter but definitely death and like how karai is kind of like not the referee but the one like the, the flag holder that you know says the fight will start, but oh yeah, this is right, this is when he tells her that she will not be allowed to fight. Yep, and she awaits her own punishment. He's still pissed at her, even though he's about in his eye, he's about to get what he wants. And I thought he didn't get what he wants too, and kill Hamato Yoshi. So that makes two of us. <laughs> oh, but just like the couple panels when this fight starts, and they they have a they have a panel of them charging each other. That's a really good panel. Oh yeah, the four turtles and you know Donatello being shellhead, and then the four mutants. Like it's a really good panel. And it it goes hard. I mean, this is a scene I would like to see. I like how they have uh, Raph spinning his uh, side, just standing there, just itching because he got to think. He's standing next to what is almost his dead brother, and he's trying to get payback, which he says, I think, yeah, for some serious payback as he kicks Rocksteady right in his chin. Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of anger. Really like it. this, this is where Raph really shines, and his his awe. He's finally let able to let everything out. And this is also a really good fight, too. Like, and, and they get the early advantage. They get the drop on, on these bigger, clumsier mutants. But as you can see how that turns. <laughs> I mean, Mike Angelo takes out one of Bludgeon's teeth. I think he's like, ooh, look, a shark tooth. Even though that, that tooth pearls back at a different panel. It's not missing anywhere. But ooh, ooh, ooh. You know, there. And, like, there's some shell head ends up where Mike Donatello, you know, he grabs Koya and pulls her down from the sky with a little grappling hook. Like, they do some good stuff. But then eventually the fight does turn on them and they start getting their ass beat. Because, like, the one the last, because it comes to a point, yeah, when they get their ass beat, you see all four turtles laying in a circle and it says, this is bad. And you see the four mutants coming ready to kill them, essentially. Leo's really getting his ass beat. Uh, all the other brothers are holding their own. Leo at this point is not oh, yeah. doing his best. And you got to think, like, he's usually the most well trained, the most focused and. I guess that might show it would reflect just how unfocused he truly is going into this because he's getting his ass beat. Yeah, it's it's cool. And then there's another thing where you see Kitsune, you know, showing what she's up to because you have Angel who wants to jump in the fight and save the turtles. And Alapex like, we can't get involved. And all of a sudden you have Kitsune, you have a panel where she's doing that gold flame again, showing that she's, you know, cast, casting magic. And she's like, but know this, no matter how this finishes, you will be safe at home with me. And she has her face kind of look, look like a look like a fox. Yeah, I like that. I I oh, she is such an evil ass character. It's great. I can't wait to see where it goes. <sighs> so there's that, and then that brings us to issue fifty, the one I've been waiting for two years to read. <laughs> <laughs> this is a cool ass cover too. Yeah, it is a cool cover. This is also the image that's going to be the cover image for this episode because I didn't like the other one, so I went with this. Yeah, it's definitely the best one. I mean, it looks it looks very epic, and you finally see these two go at it. Yeah, Splinter and Shredder. This is also a big issue. This issue is much is like a fifty page issue, where normal comics like twenty something. This is a forty page. It's definitely a bigger issue. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I was looking at that when I was reading. I'm like, I'm like, this didn't end yet. <laughs> it just keeps going. So it picks up right where the last issue ends, where they're you know the turtles are on the ground. Bebop is or no rock. I should know this. Rocksteady is about to kill Donatello again. He gets his hammer ready, then. Down till just shoots him in the face with a laser. I like that. So I thought that was cool. And they kind of start to get their... This is when they start to get the hang of the fight, where you have Donatello holding them off with a flamethrower attack, and Splinter tells them they have to work together, work as brothers, and not, you know, and, and use strategy to win. 
And I like this. I think this is when you start to see things change. You have Leo rushing at them going, Forefather! And they're all yelling, Forefather! Mm-hmm. It's another epic panel. But this is when the fight works in their favor. Like, they all do different things to distract the mutants. Well, they, they start to use actual strategy instead of just kind of winging it. Yeah. You know, and they, they do much better. Like, they're actually taking them down. I mean, they're hurting them. Because, again, yeah. these all have the power above them. Like, uh, who is it? Raph and Mikey use uh, Bebop and Rocksteady's clumsiness against them. Leo's focusing on Koya's wings and taking the flight ability away from her. And then Donnie, you see what he fucking does to Bludgeon, which is... He blinds him! It's not reversible, by the way. Oh, that that doesn't go away, huh? No. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, because he, he shines him in the light face light with a light. Oh, yeah. he's When he says he can't see and he's blind, he's not bullshitting. I thought it was just going to be temporary. I didn't think he's blind the rest of the book. Yeah, surprise. Ooh, well, okay. it, it takes a twist, but he, he is blind. Yeah. Okay. I look forward to seeing where that goes through, damn it. But it, it's during this part when they're in the fight where Hamato Yoshi or Splinter just like has a little like meditation moment where it shows in the past when Shredder killed his kids and him. Mm-hmm. And again, this I thought for sure he was going to be killed. Just because you're doing all like all this flashback stuff, I'm like, it's coming. <clears throat> It sure seems like it, and I think that's what, you know, in a way they wanted you to, to figure that out. Maybe they would have killed each other, you know, something like that. They wanted you to think something along the yeah. lines. It's very much like Age of Ultron, Marvel movie, where they make you think Hawkeye is going to die. They show he has a family, he has kids, he keeps saying, I'm getting too old for this, and stuff like that. Yeah, he doesn't die, but they make you think he's going to die in that movie. Mm-hmm. I really thought he was done in that movie. I do like how Michelangelo and and, Ra- and Raphael are the ones that kind of go after Bebop and Rocksteady. Like, they get them to fight each other, too, because they're idiots. <laughs> right, and they came up with a plan just on the fly. It worked out. And then you also see a panel where Future Toy, they're using the ooze that the gator brought him, Letterhead, and putting it into Resurrect Donnie. And then they're like, well, we don't know if this will work. And then they just hit the button and said, you know, we'll see. Yeah, they overdose his ass with ooze. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a deluge of ooze, they call it. Mm-hmm. I thought that was cool. And you kind of get another like flashback to Hamato Yoshi and Shredder talking and disagreeing. And this is after he's already killed the, their masters. So I, I like that. I, I like seeing them fight and how they do D wing Koya. And then the fact that, you know, they blind, you know, just everything that happens to them, how they beat, they beat these four. And of course it's the last two to go down are Bebop and Rocksteady. After they, yeah. Well, they're, they're the most, uh, indestructible. Yeah. Most, uh, yeah. I think, do they, how do they take them down? Oh, yeah, they run into a wall. I mean, they take out, like, a ton of foot soldiers when they run into a wall. They still keep going. Well, they're beating the shit out of each other, too. You can that just too. imagine how much that hurts, because in that that panel there where Raph and Mike are kind of flipping all around them, they're smacking the shit out of each other there. Then into a wall, and then you <laughs> see what happens next. And you have a, a small scene of Kitsune manipulating Alopex some more. Just getting her, her hooks in her. Yeah. Again, another... For the next arc, you'll see where that goes, but planting seeds for the next arc, putting her hooks in her. You know, I keep thinking I'm going to get tired of reading this book and want to move on to other stuff, and I just don't want to stop reading this damn book. Uh, not yet, my friend. <laughs> I, know, I know. It'll be a good break after we finish this one, but God, uh, I'm excited. But no, you see Koya and Blungeon are just out of the fight, and it isn't until Shellhead, Donatello, decides, like, I'm going to end this. And he runs into them, and and I like how the last thing he, say, or he says, that's going to be... No, he's committing suicide. No, that's going to take something a bit more drastic. Bye, fellas. It's been a blast. And he just self-destructs right in Bebop and Rocksteady's face. <laughs> yeah, as he's getting a call from uh, Fugitoid, right? I mean, it's, yep. it's he didn't he he really doesn't have a lot of time to explain. Like you can imagine if he tried that moment, the other trolls like, no, don't do it, and try to talk him out of it. He's just got to do it. This is one of those cases where there is literally no time. But that moment when all of a sudden he after he after he blows up and then Donatello just jumps in and hits both of them in the face with his new his new staff. That was awesome. Yeah, it was it was pretty damn cool. I was like, this is super. This is super cool. And then they Boy, they from burnout to smack him in the face with <laughs> both as new both that. Uh, and then, then they go, and then they, you know, then they have to finish the gauntlet, which is now the fight Shredder versus Splinter and the Turtles. And I like how Splinter's like, oh, or Shredder's like, we're going to go up to the ro- the roof since you enjoy spending so much precious time in your head wandering through the cosmos. Yeah, I, I was looking at that. It was kind of interesting take that Shredder was the one that picked it. But hey, I'll take it because in Turtles tradition, 
when they finally have the, the face off with Shredder, as in the first comic, they, they faced him on a roof. And in, in the first movie, they faced him on a roof. It, it had to be on a roof in this one, too. I wouldn't have <laughs> enjoyed it as much if it wasn't. So do you think there's a trash compactor down below the roof? Nearby, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe uh, before mm-hmm. Casey and April hit the road, and you know, Casey's down there just uh, ready commits to, murder, you know, something like that. Yeah, I mean, straight up just commits murder. Yeah. Oops, <laughs> I just can't believe how that's in a kid's book. <laughs> straight up murder, like, oops, yeah, we're just trapped the man. Oh, well, and it was so normal <laughs> to me at that age. <laughs> hey, me too, it was great. Oh, that's all I could think of when I saw this when them on the roof, and then you see them attack, attack him one by one. I'm like, this is fucking Turtles movie all over yeah, again. It is. And I can hear the, the theme, the music in the background. Like, nothing. That, that scene was so goddamn epic. Like, I don't, I don't know if I could ever pull it off that good again. What like, do you hear? This you comic does a good job. At, yeah, when they, you mean when they, <laughs> they finally beat him? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's so fucking epic. I can't even remember the music, by the way, that goes on in that scene. It's been a while. Uh, well, it's, it's very atmospheric. Watch the scene when you're done with this, and you won't regret it. <laughs> Hey, it's on Paramount. Hey, so I could. There you go. Or also you on YouTube, I'm sure. Seen on YouTube, yeah. Yes, that's what. <laughs> or watch the whole movie. Fuck it. <laughs> it is a good movie. I gotta do that this year. I haven't done it this year yet. I haven't watched it in two or three years. Whenever we, whenever we did it for the show, I think that was like three years ago at this point. Because mm. that was the original cast, so it's been a while. I haven't seen it since then. But it's just such an epic fucking fight, too. Like each panel of them just attacking Shredder, like they attack in a group and he takes them down and they attack singly and he's taking them down. It's just like, he's such a badass. I, I love this. Well, Shredder says it, or Splinter says it best when he talks about the power that Shredder has. It, it is who he is. It has seeked him out and, it, and it's it's overwhelming in most cases. It's just, he, he so happens to be a twisted evil bastard. Yeah. And you also get another scene of a flashback of Hamato Yoshi and, and Shredder. And, like, again, just showing where he's trying to control his anger. And, again, I'm thinking Splinter's dead. Like, Splinter's going to die in this because that's what makes sense. You know, that would be the the icing on the cake kind of thing for this to be like, you know, he's not going to make it out of this because he sacrifices himself for the turtles. I do like the moment with him and Raph, too. And and comparing Raph to a young version of his, his own dad. Yeah, that was cool. I, you gotta, I guess you can kind of try to see it from Shredder's eyes where Shredder had a certain level of respect for Yoshi when they were younger because of that rage. Because Shredder, in a sense, has that and he respects it. So he sees it in Raph all over again. And you can imagine how he would like to manipulate and, and forge Raph into his own soldier. Like as, as instead of it being Yoshi, his own son with that rage. Yeah, he even offers him a job, I think. He does. He says, "Yeah, he says I, a spirit will walk him to the foot once he is gone." And that's when he stabs Raphael in the in the leg with one of his own thighs. Mm-hmm. And Michelangelo gets involved too, and like he's the la- and then he's you know he's like, "I'm tired of you hurting people, hurting my family," and you know he gets his ass beat too, of course. Which Shredder still commends him on on what he did, I and mean, he's still skilled. He just and in Shredder's eyes, Michelangelo is probably the weakest. <laughs> Like that's fair, yeah. And individual out of all of them, not that he is. He's he's a damn good fighter, I'm sure. But it's just spirit wise, personality wise, Shredder looks down on him as some soft weakling. Yeah. And then finally, after he takes out the four turtles, you have another little flashback scene of Mano Yoshi just kind of reflecting about their past. And then Mano Yoshi picks up the start with the bow staff and goes after Shredder. So can this bow staff extend? No, I don't think so. Okay, I was just curious. It kind of looked like that in one of the panels. So I was wondering maybe this is like. You know, an extender rod or something. No, no. Nah. Okay, just metal sure and solid. Cool. Yeah. But yeah, no. And one thing is really cool as he's as Splinter's fighting him, he picks up their different weapon. He picks up the nunchucks and hits him with the nunchucks. Then he loses those. Then he gets the size and he fights him with the size. He uses each one of his son's weapons. Yeah. And the way he finally like the final thing with Shredder, which again I did not see this coming. He picks up one of Leo's swords and he just dashes at him like Rooney Kenshin style. Uh, and it and he just like slashes him across the chest, and then you just see Shredder go, but how? And he just collapses. No, and everybody's eyes wide open. Yes, me too, by the way. Me too. Because mm. I did not see this guy. I didn't think Shredder was going to lose. I just didn't. And it also wasn't until the second time I read this that I realized what's happening. When he has Shredder on his knees, and you know Shredder says, I choose a warrior's honor, I didn't realize he's committing seppuku. 
Well, and look at before that even happens is they Shredder says it wasn't how this was supposed to end. And then they, they refer to each other as brothers and they, they begin to remember just how close they were before they started training as Ninja for the Foot and, and what could have been. It's, it's such a great and, scene. And I think in, in this case, Shredder would rather not have anybody else do this to him and for him other than Yoshi at this point. Yeah. But then he when he commits to Poku, I did. I was like, I was surprised. And he stabs up. But I think there's a lot of couple po- that are points you're in here. Like he tells Karai that, you know, he's going to that he that she should find a soldier. And then what does Kitsune say? Oh, and he says, if OK, he says, Kitsune, I have failed, but I do not accept failure. If what Yoshi says is true, if there are many paths, I will find the one that leads back to you. And he says, I will wait. The, the, the I will be waiting my dragon warrior. And then he stabs himself in the gut with the claws and Splinter beheads him because that's what you do when someone commits seppuku. As I say, goodbye to each other and refer to each other as brothers. I will see you again in the in the forest, brother. I I do not doubt it, my brother. But he cuts his head off and then he gives the bloody sword back to Leo. <laughs> so yeah, here you go. <laughs> uh, and Michelangelo starts freaking the fuck out. Oh yeah, he lost his fucking mind. I mean, Wait, that just... even more so. He probably like the sh- shredder death. That's horrible enough. And then. Splinter sits here and like, yeah, I'm going to take a tour to the full plan. And then Mike's like, oh, this is bullshit. Like, I've already dealt with it. <laughs> and you see Alopex holding up Raphael. Like, you have Karai that says she's going to go back to Japan or something. Yeah, so she's going to go back to Japan. Let me see her wording here. I do need to ruin. Yeah. All right, and I understand now that I must look to the past if I'm ever to attain those same attributes where it all began to Japan. So it just, realistically, she wants to bring the foot back to its its former ways and former glory. And the only way she's going to really do that is travel to the place where it began before Shredder ever ruined it. Yeah. And then she offers a sword to Splinter to take over the foot. And this is when Michael drops the nunchucks and just jumps off the building. Yep. <laughs> but I like how Splinter's smart can... enough. He says, Kisun stays here under my watchful eye. Yep. I bet you couldn't uh, figure out where Mikey goes. Yeah, I saw the cover of issue 51. I know where he goes. Oh, there he is. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> the Mutanimals. There you go. But then Splinter picks up Shredder's mask, and I was waiting for him to put it on. I was waiting for that, where he just has another flashback of them when he was kids. And then you just see the last, the last, well, not the last panel. One of the last panels is them standing up, looking over the town, and he says, we embrace our destiny. And I swear this is one of the covers of or one of the panels and one of the first couple issues of Splinter looking over this. Or maybe Secret History of the Foot. They look over the city. I think that's, uh, yeah, it's uh, Shredder and uh, Kitsune. Mm-hmm. Now, I love the glow of New York and what they did here. It feels like the epic ending of a movie. Uh, it does. This it. could have been a movie. I actually used this uh, whole page as, as my uh, PC like wallpaper <laughs> at one point. I can see why. Might actually do that again. <laughs> <laughs> it's tempting, actually, too. Now, what is my my wallpaper is Marvel stuff at the moment, but yeah, that is tempting. And then the last page of this got me really questioning. So it shows feudal Japan, and it shows when he killed Splinter and his four sons, and you have some random Utram scientist, and you have Krang, and he tells him to collect DNA and Q&A specimens from the bodies. And the guy's like, as you wish, General Krang. So that kind of tells me that when they were resurrected, that's something a little, something a little different to do than uh, what we think it was. huh? Quite possibly, yeah. You'll see how, uh, how it goes. How long is that going to take me to see this part? Because <laughs> 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 my guess is definitely not the next arc. So, And that's the end of Vengeance. There you go, man. Was that everything you could have imagined? It was really good. It was damn good. And I keep thinking like I was getting bored of Turtles. But it's like I'm not. Like the series doesn't quit. To what issue 100 you said? Yeah, then it half asses it. But um, but we'll see. I mean, it does pick up eventually too. So I don't want to shit on it completely. <laughs> no, I get it. I, I know it hurts you. Oh, it does. It definitely does. Yeah, and it's like, and you know, something I've been, I was so excited waiting to read this because ever since we did change is constant. And you made a comment saying, like, hey, wait till you get to issue 50. And I was like, I'll never read issue 50. I don't care. But I never got a spoil. No one ever told me. I kept, you know, I, I didn't want to know. And now I'm so happy to finally say that we finished this. Something that we, we, it wasn't until 
earlier this year that we got back to get we got started recording these again it was we did we did turtles forever and uh, released in january and that was when it, that whole turtle bug started this year and then ever since then we've been doing this series we started with krang war that we published back in late february recorded sure. earlier but published in late february you know and the other two turtle comics we did you know the 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 first one we did was back in 2020 november when we did the first one finally and then they took us almost a year to get to shadows of the past in 2020 september of 2021 and now we've just been non-stop with this and i i i am so happy that we started doing this together i love these arcs it's great man it lets me relive one of the greater comic series i've i've ever read and my love for turtles will never die so it's just it's it's fun it's fun all over again and to actually have somebody to talk to about it like because i went through these imagine just on my own loving every single part of it but i can't talk to anybody about it. No, it's not. <laughs> you need special people. For it. Oh, so yeah, no, it's I mean, it, it. It grabbed me. It grabbed me more than I ever thought I'd be interested in this, and I, I I can't believe how much I'm enjoying reading these. And like, I really thought when we got to fifty, I was like, yeah, I'm done. We can put this down. I don't care. But I'm not. Like, we're gonna take a little bit of a break, and we're gonna do other turtle stuff that you're gonna hear when we come back. Because you're when you hear this, it'll be August, September era, right before we start October. And then we won't get back to this until November when this will kick back up again. Some turtle stuff. Not this series, but other turtle stuff we have planned. Right. Because I there's a couple there's a there's a five issue mini mini series from twenty nineteen I have to read first. So that involves some mighty morphin turtles. Oh yeah. So that, I, after I've been seeing the covers for the second one, I'm like, fuck, I need to read both of these like now. Yeah. And again, I've been holding off because I could have read that second series, uh, second series already. But uh, at least I read all the first. So that should be yeah. fun. And you get to read the second one for the first time because we'll probably do it like right after that. I would have said we should. Yeah. Just just get them both out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is I'm now going to wa- probably want to buy the Funko Pops of those. So there's, I've seen Funko Pops of Turtles and Power Ranger off. I'm like, I don't care about those, but that might change. I have all the the NECA figures that came from that side comic. <laughs> Even the Shredder? Uh, not NECA, um, Hasbro. I mean, I'm sorry, Hasbro ones. You have the Shredder Green Ranger one? Yeah, I actually do. <sighs> I have I, I, every turtle that came out with it, I have it. Tommy that's a picture of your two favorite things. Yeah, oh, fuck, I had to do it. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, like I, I actually love like when Hasbro or NECA or anybody come out with comic-related versions of the of the characters i just i just feel like it's so damn cool like even the power rangers comics hasbro has those or has that series so they came out with the the ranger slayer the pink ranger from the comic they came out with draken and a few of them actually some real cool shit from the comics and i'm waiting for them to bring out the omega rangers if they ever do that like i'm fucking itching for them to do that what are the omega rangers well if we ever get to that series you'll see but uh um, okay it's <laughs> How do I explain this in, a, in the simplest of terms? They're rangers that have to do with more of like the universe and all of space. Okay. It, it's a, it's the older power, but it's it's all like all of space. Whereas the mighty Morphin rangers that we see all the time are primarily just on Earth doing what they do. Okay. And then there's more spinoffs coming right now. There's a Ninja Turtles and Street Fighter coming out. The first issue's come out so far. I think that's all that's come out so far. Yeah, I saw it actually at Lost World. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be a five issue series I, that I'm interested in. Like, there's just so much stuff with this, and there's also a because I was wondering since you mentioned figures, there was like these weird turtles, Stranger Thing figures. I'm like, why the fuck are they have these figures out? And turn out there's a <laughs> turtle Stranger Thing comic coming out soon. Yeah, I actually passed on those figures, uh, but yes, the, there's a comic that I'll probably check out. Oh, I will for sure too because I. I like Stranger Things, and I just remember seeing the figures. I'm like, why are there figures for this? And they're even the original version of the figure where they have the red bandana, bandana, bandanas. What the fuck? I cannot talk. <laughs> it just confused well, yeah, me. The bandanas they had in the in the 80s. Oh, things takes place, good point. So. Good point. But I was just so confused. I'm like, why are these two paired together in the comic? And these these are on clearance now, where I've seen them at Target, and now the comic is coming out in July of 2023. So it's like you kind of missed here, buddy. He should have, you know, maybe released. But I guess it's comic, but not like it's a big thing. So right. But no, I'll I'll definitely read it and see where they go. But yeah, oh, we should go to shelf stack a box. And what about you, Rich? You go first. Well, I mean, this is it, man. This is the climax of the the main arc. And like I I gave you a heads up with a couple years back. I mean, I thought it was amazing then. I still think it's amazing now. 
there's I, I can't say anything negative about this at all like it's one of the best arcs i've ever read in comics and i think that speaks for itself so i definitely uh shelved this one okay I'm going to do the same. I'm going to put it on the shelf, too. I, I had such a great time reading this, and it was such a great buildup, and it was a good payoff. Like, the payoff was awesome. So there's no issue with that. This was fun to finally to finally cover. And it, I waited two years, and I wasn't spoiled, so I'm, I'm glad with that. Yeah, I'm glad. I, I mean, to even hear your reaction, like, I remember you texted me. I texted you that <laughs> night. <laughs> yeah. 11 o'clock. I'm like, oh, he's not. I, I hope his, his phone isn't on. Text, text, text. Yeah, it was uh, something like you said. Oh, he been at it. I was like, yeah, there, there. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Yeah, because I was I was in bed. Uh, I normally I go to bed by ten thirty, and I'm in bed. I'm reading my comics, and and I'm like, I should go to bed. I got one more issue. I got to read, and the issue just kept going. I'm like, oh, I can't stop. And that I saw that I just had to text you immediately. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, he'll appreciate. Yeah, my I, yeah, I couldn't uh, couldn't blame you for shooting me that text. I mean. That's that was it. That is exactly what I wanted you to see. <laughs> it was so fucking good. Like I remember back when we did the first one of this arc, uh, Change of Content back in 2020, when Mike was on the show with us. I remember Mike went to work and told someone that he was was talking about turtles. Like, oh yeah, I can't wait till when they pee head shredder. And he's like, thanks, buddy. And he didn't tell me what happened. He's like, yeah, I know some idiot, you know, spoiled it for me. He never said a oh, word. Oh God! But I just remember that, like, and every so often it come up. He's like, yeah, I know what happens. Like, he's like that idiot spoiled it. But he also not glad he didn't hear that. <laughs> no, I was glad. I was, you know, he. I was glad that he didn't say anything because, I, again, I really thought Splinter was dead. But it's just like, and it does really feel like an end of an era too, in a way, because Kang's put away, Shredder's put away. Like, you know, they they put away two of their big villains from the '87 cartoon. And they're just gone for the moment. You know, I know they're not gone, gone, but if they feel gone. So I thought that was cool. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, with Shredder out of the picture for now, I mean, that opens up uh, a void. So who, what villain is going to take, you know, fill in that void now? That's that's what you need to. Well, I know Null takes place at some point in this because I've been clicking things a little bit. And I know that. Yeah, that's all I know for sure. And I and I figure Baxter is going to play a big part, too. But we probably won't get back to this till next year from here. We'll probably my goal is doing do a bunch of spin-off stuff and then next year we'll start recording the next set. Yeah. I it'll probably be uh good timing. Because we got what, three Batman and Turtle comics to do, a movie. Last Ronin. Oh god, yeah, I, I gotta read Last Ronin. Man, I don't know what I want to read more. Yeah, Last yeah. Ronin or Turtles and Power Rangers. Hmm. One's gonna be that's more fun, that's for sure. Yeah. That's rough. I mean, if you want like straight up mature Adult storytelling, you go last Ronin. If you want a good, fun time, go with Turtles and Power Rangers. All right, Turtles and Power Rangers it is. <laughs> All right. I think last Ronin would have me more interested if I didn't know who it was. Sure, but that that's only, you know, during that first, like, issue. After that, I mean, it's... Oh, it's in the first issue that they tell you? Yeah, I think it's in the first issue. Oh, I thought it was, like, later on, because people are like, oh, who's the last Ronin? We don't know. And there was, But maybe it's just because it wasn't out yet. Oh, yeah. I think it's like at the very end. I actually figured it out a few panels before that because I was paying attention to the way the turtles talked and kind of what they look like. And I was like, you know what? I have a feeling it's this person. And it was. <laughs> OK. And I, and I know the lost years are out now too. whatever that is for the last Ronin. Yeah. So I, that right there, I'm going through that little by little. That takes place. It, it's kind of weird. It's combination. So it takes place after the last Ronin. But also, it has flashbacks of Mikey's journey up to the last Ronin. So it's kind of half and half. Okay. Yeah, I just I heard a lot about last Ronin. I'm like, yeah, I need to read it. You, I think it came out in 2021. And it's ongoing. It's still going. So you got to think of um, how you want to tackle that one when it's done. Well, the Lost Years, is that that's still going? Oh, uh, yeah, it's still going right now. I thought it was just going to be like a like a mini series. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how many issues are thrown into it, but I want to say it's still going. Okay. Yeah, I just haven't paid any attention to it. It's good, but we'll probably just tackle the main, the main loss, you know, lost Ronin thing, and then kind of see where it goes. See if they keep. Well, see, them. last lost years, or maybe it is over by now. I don't know, but it, the last one came out April twenty sixth. Might be done, or they might just be slow at making them. But it looks sometimes like that happens with comics; they're just not fast because it takes looks, a while. It looks like they're going for every month and a half, so it could be the fourth one could be coming out soon if, if it is. Okay. I don't even, did I read this? Yeah, I read this one. I read the third one, so... There's five, at least, announced per the well, there you go. Turtlespedia, but that's all I got. Okay. 
that's enough of that. So <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed all our Turtles content we've been bringing you. There will be more Turtles content. Just comics will take a break, at least the main series, and then we'll we'll, we'll get back at some point next year and start, and then you'll get a whole deluge of them all over again because. The time you're hearing this, you still have. By the time we're no, by the time you're hearing this, we already started recording other stuff because we're recording this in July. You're not going to hear this until September so, or August. I don't remember when I put it in, but yeah, yeah, a little while. So definitely go. You can find all the stuff we do on Podbean. You can just search TMNT and it'll bring up all the comics that we've done. Plus, just search Teenage. You can find the rest of the turtle stuff we've done. There's a lot. And if you want to support this podcast, we do a Patreon for a little dog. You can support our Patreon. We have polls every month. So definitely go vote in those polls and. We have a Discord. Please join our Discord and chat with us. And please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and on YouTube. And want to give a shout-out to my awesome intro and outro, courtesy of Helena at Hell Hats, where you can follow her on TikTok. And give a shout-out to my buddy Bill Tucker, who started his own podcast, Gamer Looks at 40. I think that's everything I need to say, so... Kawabunga! Kawabunga!